Fired up. Uh, let's go ahead and do a roll call. Let's see. Andrew, are you here? Here. That's great. Uh, Sunita, are you here? I'm here. Great. Um, Howard, have you gotten on yet? Howard does. Uh, send me an email. He's, he's running a little late on a previous call. Um, Eshfar, are you here? Hello. Okay. Um, Dick, are you yes. here? Thank yes. you, Dick. Uh, Franco, are you on? Franco's trying to log on right now. He's right next to me. And that's you, right, Dave? Yes, sir. That's great. And uh, I am Drew Lanza. I make up a fifth. We have a quorum. We can go ahead um, and proceed. Now I'll rerun the roll call um, as folks join uh, in e progress. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Can you uh, please call the meeting to order? <laughs> okay, we're in order. Well, I'm kind of broken. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. The meeting's in gold order. Um, we don't have a closed session today. Um, so let's start right away with the open session. Um, we have no orders of the day per se, but let me um, remind everyone, we don't have time but let me remind everybody, you know, we're on Zoom. And so the one thing we want to avoid is everybody talking at once. We've never had a problem with this. So because of that, we're a little less formal than on a lot of other Zoom calls. If you have a question, go ahead and jump in. That's worked very well. Um, we, are, we are required to do roll call votes so we can properly record that, and we will do that. And for weighty matters, none of which we have today, we will go round robin to make sure that everyone's um, heard from. Okay, as I said, we have no items of uh, sunshine to wave, uh, which brings us to the um, consent calendar. Does anybody want to pull anything off the consent calendar? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar. Motion to approve, Santos. I've got a motion from Dick. Uh, who's second? Did anybody second that? Second, Gardener. Got a motion from Santos, second from Gar uh, Gardner. Let's go around. Andrew, how do you vote? Aye. Nita, how do you vote? Aye. Howard, are you here? Eshvar, are you here? Aye. That's great. Thanks. I, for the record, let, note that Eshvar Menon is in attendance. Dick, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Franco, how do you vote? 
That's okay. Dave, how do you vote? Aye. And I'm Chair Lanz. I vote aye. That is six ayes, uh, which carries the day. Believe it or not, <laughs> this has to be some kind of record for me. We are turning this over to you three minutes in the meeting. Um, don't get cocky. Over to you, Prabhu. <laughs> well, the caffeine hasn't kicked in, Mr. Chairman. But I, <laughs> I will do my best. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so let's see. Uh, we do have Makita and Newberger presenting performance reports this morning. But uh, before I turn it over to them, a couple of notes here. Um, I do have unofficial, unaudited numbers from Makita as of uh, the day before yesterday performance. Fiscal year to date, uh, I'm sure you've all been uh, keeping track of the Omicron uh, virus, the variant. Uh, there's been a lot of volatility in the market. The healthcare trust in November so far, month to date, has down 1.92%. And, but fiscal year to date, uh, this is from July 1st, it's somewhat flat, it's a negative 12 basis points. And the pension system is, the pension plan, uh, November month to date down 1.47%, but fiscal year to date is up 2.43%. Again, these are just rough estimates. And I also want to share with the board uh, on November 9th, I had the privilege of presenting our annual fee report to the city council. And uh, trustees know that you know, in years past, uh, I have been accompanied by Vince, trustee Sanzeri uh, to actually make this presentation. Uh, this year, uh, I was very kindly accompanied by trustee Sunita, uh, who was there to support us uh, in presenting that report. And there were no surprises there. I think we've done a lot of education in the last three years that uh, the council does understand that fees are largely driven by asset allocation and the, the types of investments that we make. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, unless there are questions, I would like to turn this over to, uh, to Newberger and to Casey Boyer. Uh, thanks for any questions before we go to Casey. Over to you, Casey. Hello. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm in Dallas, so I have had a little more time for my caffeine to kick in. So I will go ahead and get started. But I'm going to share my screen. So give me just a minute. Oh, host disabled screen sharing. So if someone could enable me to screen share, that would be great. Hi, Casey, you should be able to share. You are co host. Um, okay, let me let me try again. Unfortunately, I'm getting I'm getting a message that says host disabled participant screen share. Oh, I see it now came through. I just had to be patient. Okay, perfect. Um, well, I am here today uh, to go through Q2 results for police and fire. Um, I'm going to turn uh, to the summary page, which is um, really most of the information I can I can cover here. It's been, again, a really great quarter. Um, we've also recently released Q3 information, which has been uh, a good quarter as well. So we've been consistently up and to the right, um, basically ever since Q2 of 2020. Um, we saw uh, the pandemic kind of affect Q1 2020, and then ever since then, uh, the portfolio in value has been increasing. Um, when we look at the returns here for Q2, um, we're seeing um, an uptick from Q1 in terms of a net multiple. In Q1, it was 1.6. We saw a nice uplift there in Q2 to 1.7 times. And as a reminder, this is all net information, so net of all um, uh, fees. 
And then um, I do have to apologize, the net IRR 37.8% listed there um, is a mistake. It, we caught this last night, it should be 35.4. So we are going to update that and make sure your team has the right information on that one. Um, still really good, but um, wanted to make sure to point that out so as not to be misleading, it should be 35.4. Um, it is- That is definitely uh, a woohoo moment either way. Thanks, Casey. <laughs> yeah, um, not exactly what we wanna find in our reports, but um, still very great. And we will take 35.4 any day of the week. Um, that is for Q2. We, we expect Q3 to be up, um, I guess, it's already released, so we know it's it's up right around 13, 14%. So we'll see um, some great returns again for Q3 when we come back. Um, one really important thing that uh, doesn't jump out when you just look at this page, but we are starting to see a lot of really great realizations and exits within portfolio companies and co-investments within your portfolio. So we've been able to really start distributing money back to your program. At, if you look specifically at the net distributions for Q2, you'll see 11.4 million. At Q1, that number was 2 million. So we distributed you know, 9.5 million um, over uh, the Q2 period. I went, I went back um, and kind of looked through the distributions we've done recently. Since Q2 through November, we've distributed another 20 million back to your program. So um, really excited about that um, point and um, something we see continuing as the portfolio develops and matures and investments um, are realized. Um, turning to the next pages, pages three, four, um, five, six, and seven, look through the underlying investments and how they compare to their peers. So on pages three and four, you'll see the legacy investments which were completed prior to the Newberger partnership and how their performance relates to their peers. Um, as I've said before, and, and I think you all know, some of these are, especially on page three, are fairly old, so I wouldn't expect their performance to change too much at this point. Um, there are some, some newer ones on page four um, dating back to Vintage's 2018, so those still have um, a lot of runway um, in terms of um, gaining uh, on their uh, performance metrics. Um, page five is where we start the Newberger partnership. Um, I'll, I'll point out a couple here because there always tends to be questions. Um, investment 54 is still one that we um, are waiting for performance to start. They were a fund that we made an investment in a few years ago now. We still have the utmost confidence in the GP. They've been very cautious in investing and they've been slow to deploy. So what you're seeing here is their J curve. Um, they have a lot of investments left to make in their portfolio. Um, they are a special situation, so kind of a turnaround um, consumer fund. Um, so, you know, they're being very careful in what they are making their investments into. Um, if you uh, look through all of these, I would say for the most part, um, the core tiling and benchmarking has pretty much stayed the same um, since. Q1, not a, a, not a huge jump on any of them. Uh, 
Um, turning to the next page is where we show some information on the exposures within your portfolio, more on an underlying basis. So um, our goal of this program was to not only be consistent in making investments each vintage year, um, but also combining the use of primaries, co-investments and secondaries into the portfolio um, to one, make the, the, the fund um, efficient and kind of produce those strong early returns, um, which we're seeing within um, specifically co-investments You'll see the pie charts here based on the committed amount as well as invested. Um, as a reminder, commitments means those are the commitments we have made to date. Private equity funds call capital over time. So you'll see um, the invested is the capital that is actually in the ground today. Um, so you kind of see the difference there in what has been committed versus what capital has actually been deployed into companies. Page nine, um, this is benchmarking and showing performance at your overall program level. So as I mentioned, um, we're starting to see the uh, really great performance uh, that can be generated from using investment, different investment types. So you'll see the co-investments are marked at um, a 1.93 times um, and the primary is at 1.49 on a gross basis. Uh, that's exactly what we would expect. The primaries, um, will definitely increase over time. A lot of those primary funds are still investing, making investments. Some have made realizations, but they're very much still developing and maturing. Um, and we've frankly seen some really great co-investment um, uh, returns. And you'll see um, that uh, you're really starting to get the gross DPI is the distributions compared to the paid in capital. You're starting to see some, some great numbers there in terms of capital that's being distributed back uh, to your fund. And then at the bottom here, you'll see um, the peer comparison. So currently second in terms of net IRR. And I'll just again, point out 3.7 not correct, it should be 35.4. However, that still keeps you squarely in the second quartile. Um, that actually doesn't change um, that metric. So um, second quartile and first on the total value to paid in. The next couple pages um are a lot of lots of information about the underlying investments um i'll turn to the last page which at the very bottom splits out i can make it a little bigger very hard to see um the uh, specifics around the legacy investments newberger's investments and then the total amounts um uh, and then the combination there. Um, great, great performance. I would say um, we still have a lot of room and a lot of time for that to continue. Um, but I think at this point, I'll, I'll open it up to questions if anyone has any. Uh, good, floor is open. Anybody have any questions for Casey? I had one if... Uh... Uh, just jump in, Selena. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of questions. You in in the summary tables, you're showing things net of fees. Maybe I'm just so fresh out of the fees presentation that I focus on it. But I'm curious on the on the more detailed ones. You show a gross IRR number. Yeah. So when you're looking at investments, at like for instance, the page that we're on, page eleven, the schedule investments, you're seeing the investments uh, one by one and the under, these are the underlying investments within your portfolio. 
gross here means that it is gross of Newberger fees, but it's actually net of those oh, okay. funds fees. Um, so we're, we're, it's a little unclear using the word gross um, uh, simply because our fees aren't applied at an underlying level. It's more of at a program level. So it doesn't really make sense to um, you know, split out our fees by investment. Um, but you are seeing this net of those fees. Understood. Okay. I did see the footnote that said NB fees, not I understand. Yeah. Yes. Uh, one other question. Is there a way, is there a sense on or a monitoring of, um, I'm, call, I'm not sure what uh, might be the terminology in the private equity world, but in terms of aging of primary, so to speak, that the time from when we make a commitment to where they've started funding or something like that, where we are paying fees, but not really benefiting from them having deployed capital. Like if there's a fund, let me, let me sort of say this again. So if there's a fund where we've been sitting, that's been sitting on our commitment, so to speak, for mm -hmm. three to four years and not deployed much capital, is there a way of monitoring that at a high level or is it sort of fund by fund? So we actively monitor each fund investment that we make. So I mentioned before, um, one of the funds that is um, being very cautious in their deployment mm -hmm. and being very careful on, on what investments they're making. Um, we talk to that GP regularly. We've done co-investments with them before. Um, we go to their annual meetings. So we're very up to speed on what investments they're looking at why they've declined certain investments. Um, that particular GP has gotten very far along in the process on a couple of assets, but actually got outbid just based on valuation. Um, so there's lots of reasons why they may be slow to deploy. Um, sometimes it's actually a good thing, frankly, because we don't want them to be um, paying higher valuations than they're comfortable with. So we monitor each um, underlying investment um, and, and making sure that we are understanding their strategy and why they are um, at the pace that they that they are. Okay. But, but like at, a, at our, our level, at the board level, if you look at slide eight, If, if, if we have committed 70.5, 70 percent in primaries and only 53 percent is invested, or I, I know it's not 50 percent or 70 percent, but in terms of the differences mm -hmm. between the left and right, yes. I guess the question I have is, at what point do we feel like, oh gosh, they're, they have made a commitment, but we're not sort of really deploying the funds? Yeah, so um, what you're actually seeing there is I, I turned back to uh, look at some of these benchmarking slides, just to point out the only way that your invested capital would be very close to your committed capital is if you quit making investments. So if you look at how we're making primary fund investments, we're making them each year. So in 2020, some of these funds haven't even started calling capital. So that's where you're seeing the main difference between what's committed and what um, isn't deployed essentially. Mm -hmm. So if we went back a few years, if we just showed a pie chart based on let's say vintage year 2017, that would look much different. We would expect committed to look very similar to invested. Um, really what this chart is showing is that we're continuing to commit capital over time and it's just inherent that you are going to have a kind of a mismatch between what's committed and what is um, invested we definitely keep track of that and make sure that um, investments are are investing and in, in what we would think that they would do Understood. Yeah, it'll be helpful to have that vintage chart as a standard part of your package. I okay. think I've asked this. I've asked this 
primary versus committed question before, not primary, uh, committed versus invested question before. It'll be helpful to have a sort of a summary, I think. So, got it. Thank um, you. That's all. Thanks. Uh, any other questions for Casey? Uh, yeah, this is Howard. Oh, well, welcome. I'd love to record show that uh, Ch uh, Trustee Lee is now online. Thanks. You go, Howard. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm late. Uh, well, thank thank you, Casey, for the uh, description. I, I had actually two questions with respect to uh, the the one that you mentioned, which was investment number fifty four, uh, and you mentioned the GPs. You know them well. Um, is their track record presumably uh, better than where they are today? In other words, uh, we expect them to be second quartile or first first quartile. Is that the expectation? Yeah, their their historical track record is very good. Um, they have proven themselves in being able to um, take investments and turn them around. We've actually made a co-investment alongside of them um that was in kind of an office supply company um they did a lot of things to kind of take that company um and they kind of sold some some assets that weren't doing so well um and were able to realize and and send capital back pretty quickly but we still have it um on our books right now, it's it's still doing very well. Um, so we have confidence in them. They've they've performed in the past. Um, this is fund the 2017 vintage is fund three for them. Um, so we had prior history to make that investment and felt confident about the lead investor here um, has been in the industry in the consumer industry basically his whole career. So we have a lot of confidence um, in their leadership um, and have every reason to believe that this this will turn around. Okay. And I, and I guess because there's special situations and because evaluations are high, they're, they're losing deals because of that. Um, yep. Okay. And then um, 57 stars global uh, seems like it's underperforming. And just in general, do, have you ever made recommendations on pruning? Which investment? Uh, 57 stars global. I think I, I saw it on slide four. Oh. I mean, quartile. Have, have you ever recommended pruning? So oh, selling, selling uh, interests. Yeah. So I, I will, I, I'm not sure if Dinesh is on. This is an, yeah, an investment I'm in. not super familiar with. Okay. Yeah, so actually, uh, Trustee Lee, in regard to the legacy portfolio, the police and fire plan actually did execute a secondary sale as of June 30th of this year. So we did find an opportunity where when we look at the go forward returns of some of these more legacy investments, they had less forward looking return expectations than what we would expect from new investments that we can make through the New River Fund of One program. And we ended up actually executing a secondary sale on four different funds from the legacy portfolio. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then one last thing, I think uh, the trustee Ganapati had mentioned about the committed versus um, uh, deployed. Is there a, is there, maybe you can put a column here or something about, you know, capital called versus commitment or some, I don't know, maybe may, just to make it easier to understand. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's it for me. Uh, thanks, Howard. Any other questions for Casey? Uh, back to you, Prabhu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And now I will turn this over to Laura and Nikita uh, to cover all private markets, which is item 2C. Good morning, everyone. I hope you all had a nice Thanksgiving. Um, Jared is going to share the screen with the private markets report. Thank you, Jared. Um, so on slide two, <clears throat> we have the summary here. This does reflect the correct uh, Newberger Berman Fund of One IRR. There are many quarters where uh, Newberger's report is correct and ours is not. So, uh, so you know, it's uh, nice to have a couple of providers here since 
um, it's always possible that these Excel spreadsheets have uh, small errors and, and as uh, your um, Newberger consultant pointed out, still a phenomenal return at 35.4 for the IRR. Um, you can see each of the um, asset classes here in the private market space, um, private equity, private debt, real estate, real assets, and the newest venture capital. If you look on the far right, you can see the IRRs for the programs relative to a public markets equivalent. So the public markets equivalent, as a reminder, is, is, is um, calculated as if you were using a public markets benchmark in the same space um, and contributing capital and receiving capital back on the same dates as these funds called and distributed capital. So it's a, um, a difficult calculation, but we think it's useful to show what you would have made if you hadn't been in illiquid assets. And you can see that for the most part, um, it has been a good decision to put these funds into private markets. The IRR for your program um, for each of the areas is higher than what the public markets equivalent would have been. We'll start out with private debt on slide three. Um, you can see here that the target is 3% and your allocation is currently 3.1, so very close to target. Um, and if you take a look at um, uh, the next slide here, you can see that the distributions now are dwarfing the contributions. And um, the main reason for that is that most of the funds were committed um, back in 2010. And you can see that on slide six. You can see each individual fund here. As we've discussed, these, two th these top three funds uh, committed in 2010 were not really intended initially to be part of the private debt allocation. They were opportunistic at the time. They have not performed um, uh, per expectations, but if you take a look at all the funds that, that have been committed recently, um, particularly those under your current staff since uh, 2017, um, they are doing quite well. If you take a look at Aramark, Arbor Lane, Octagon, um, Cross Ocean, all about um, two thirds of the way down the slide, all of their IRRs are significantly higher than the peer IRRs. Um, and you see um, this program has had a, um, a, you know, sort of a steady pace of vintage year diversification since those, uh, those initial funds. And that is shown on the next slide as well. Um, it's always nice to see this upper right um, pie chart and the percent of exposure looking quite diversified. Um, that means that the, the program is maturing. Um, you do see that vintage year diversification and because private markets funds need to be committed and then called at some future date and you don't have a ton of control over exactly when they're called, it's really nice to, uh, to try to diversify by vintage year. The real assets program is on the next slide. Um, you can see here that there were a couple of funds committed back in 2016 and that's still the bulk of the exposure, um, primarily in the infrastructure space. Um, some more in 2019, and then we're trying to, uh, to staff is trying uh, in working with us to, uh, to maintain, again, that vintage year diversification. We can take a look at slide 11 for the individual funds in the real assets program. Real assets has been a little bit of a challenging space. Um, uh, you had some fluctuations with oil prices. You also had some infrastructure related issues um, relating to the pandemic. Infrastructure investments often tend to be in areas like airports and toll roads and shipping. And those have all been um, uh, areas that were you know, negatively impacted at some point from the pandemic. But you still see some strong absolute returns here. Um, Brookfield infrastructure, the top one um, with an IRR well above the peer IRR, um, uh, GIP, infrastructure partners, and Lime Rock, which is more uh, energy related uh, below the peer IRR, but still with a positive return. So you have a lot of funds here that were committed in 2019 and 2020 um, that are performing to expectations, but don't have a meaningful uh, internal rate of return yet. Uh, the real estate program, I will uh, move ahead to on page 13. This is a mature program. You've been committing, um, you can see relatively regularly since 2012, although there were some years skipped in there and, and recently your staff and Makita have been trying to, again, maintain that vintage year diversification that's so important with more regular commitments. Um, on the next slide, you can see that a new commitment this quarter was Centerbridge Real Estate, which was underwritten by both Makita and staff. Um, with $15 million. The individual funds are listed on slide 16. 
you can see um, a wide, um, diverse variety of funds here. And again, that, that you know, if you look at the vintages, um, pretty steady allocations. And for the most part, these funds in the real estate space have had um, uh, relatively strong returns uh, meeting expectations. On 17, you can see um, the exposure by vintage year and, um, and, and geography. Um, again, we like to see that upper right part, pie chart, you know, quite diversified and, um, and it is on track to do that. Lastly, you have the newest part of the private markets program on page 18, the venture capital program. You can see um, the commitments that were made during uh, 2020. Um, one new one on page 19, innovation endeavors um, with a 40, or I'm sorry, a $4.2 million commitment. And the individual funds, four of them thus far on page 21, um, all of them 2020 or 2021 funds. So we don't have meaningful performance yet for them. Um, starting on page 23, I won't go through page by page, but if you're interested in the dynamics of different parts of the private markets um, uh, investing universe, we have some information um, on uh, those asset classes in general, things like private equity fundraising, um, usage of ports, um, uh, and some real estate metrics as well. So I'm happy to take any questions on private markets before we move on to your total fund. Thank you, Laura. Happy Thanksgiving in hindsight. Back to you. Anybody have any questions for Laura? Yeah. Can I get started, uh, Drew? Jump in, Ashwar. You bet. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so first, uh, just an observation. I think on the private uh, debt performance, it's very nice to see the performance has improved uh, compared to kind of the historical performance. Uh, so well done. Um, second, uh, I guess, question for Prabhu, maybe. Um, you know, I guess the realizations are great, uh, but I think if they're kind of coming in rapidly or ahead of expectations, the question is how do you redeploy it? And, uh, you know, what's the plan uh, so you don't skew kind of the asset allocation, right? Hi, Aswar, this is Dinesh, and I can help uh, answer that question. So it has been accelerated pace, especially for the private debt program. However, a lot of the funds that we've been investing in and as they're modeled in the pacing plan are for shorter deployment periods. So it's slightly ahead of what we had expected, but not uh, significantly so. So I think uh, we're continuing our, our process and we do have a good pipeline of new investments that we're looking at to, to replace these. And uh, based on the pacing plan, since these are multi-year investment periods, the, the realizations don't skew the, the program as much as possible. Um, so when we look at our overall allocation to private debt, we're only about 20 basis points below the 3% target. And uh, with new capital calls that, were, that are expected and new commitments that are being made, we expect to uh, maintain our exposure close to the 3% target. Okay, uh, thank you, Dinesh. And the last question, you know, I guess, uh, you know, the absolute performance on, you know, uh, private investments, you know, see, is strong. Uh, but as I scan kind of, you know, uh, kind of some of the numbers I've seen um, and uh, possibly there are maybe more endowments here, right? Um, you know, you've seen some eye-popping numbers which are much higher than kind of what we did, right? Um, and also, if I look to the fiscal year, you know, fiscal year, last fiscal year performance, again, strong numbers, but it looked like we were behind uh, kind of the peer group. Um, is that a question of kind of a mix of investments? Uh, what, what, what might be the reason for that? that that's, that's a great question, uh, Trustee Menon, and I'll have Laura jump in as well. In fact, uh, we did look at that. You know, uh, we've done well relative to our peers in, in the public space, but we have trailed, uh, you know, the endowment world. And I think it's a function of asset allocation, right? And so they, had, they have significantly higher allocation to private assets and especially to venture. And so I think that made the difference in the last fiscal year. Um, the, the reason okay. why, you know, some of these university numbers are really eye-popping, right? Uh, 40, 50% returns. And, and again, it's a matter of asset allocation. Um, I think I think compared to our peers, I think we have we have a little bit more than the average pension plan in terms of private assets, but compared to the endowment world, you know, mm -hmm. our allocations are, are lower. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Sure. Yeah, that's right. You know, we did look at this um, along with Prabhu um, because we were all interested in um, in looking at. You know, you see these headlines from pensions and investments and fund fire with. Mm -hmm. 
you know, X university returned 68% or something like that um, for the year. So we pulled together, um, we looked at, let's see, like six or seven, you know, that we were able to find, you know, endowments don't, don't necessarily always release um, a ton of specifics like public funds do on, you know, their underlying asset allocation. But we, um, we looked at, um, uh, you know, some high performing funds that had a fiscal year return of around 49%. And what we found is that your total equity for the San Jose funds was very similar um, to these funds. So you all are on the right track. But we did find that the highest performing funds had much higher allocations to private equity. Um, and, you know, they don't always report how much of that is venture capital. And sort of reading between the lines, I think that um, much of it probably was. Um, for example, the Cambridge Venture Index was up 68.2% for the fiscal year. So you can see how funds that had a lot um, allocated to venture had really strong returns. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Sure. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, floor is still open. Anybody else questions for Laura? Yeah, hi, hi, this is Howard. Just one quick question. I may have missed this when you, uh, when you uh, describe the differences. The, uh, the NB fund of fund, the IRR, was 37.8 or 35.4? I know 30, you mentioned 35.4 number. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so the number in our report is correct, 35.4. Okay, great. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, floor still open. Anything else? Uh, back to you, Prabhu, to go back to Laura. All right. Back to you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. I'm actually going to turn it over to Jared to talk about the total fund, uh, pension fund performance. Thanks, Laura. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, so we'll uh, just do a quick uh, review of uh, markets here for the fourth quarter. Um, there's a pretty odd thing on this chart on page four that shows that apparently the U.S. stock market doesn't go up 10% every quarter. Um, so this is the first time we've we've shown a chart with more muted returns since uh, since March uh, report of 2020. Um, but consistent with last quarter, commodities led the way here, uh, up 6.6 percent, and then tips uh, was the second leader. So you see the impact of inflation there. Um, like I mentioned, the U.S. markets basically flat, depending on which which one you want to look at in the middle. Um, and on the bottom side, the markets that didn't do as well. Um, emerging markets stands out, uh, mostly dragged down by China and, um, and you know, headlines around Evergrande. Um, small caps also didn't do very well. I think a lot of that was meme stocks dragging down parts of that market. Uh, on page five, uh, I guess there's obviously a lot of numbers here, but if you look at the three-year column in particular, I think it's interesting that shows if you just look at the domestic equity to pull out something like Russell 3000, it's basically doubled the return of indices you look at in the foreign equity section, and it's tripled the, the uh, return of a lot of the fixed income indices. Um, so I know we've talked about that before, but that's uh, you know a bigger difference than, than we've seen in the past. Uh, toward the bottom, as we look at fixed income, it also note that um, you know, pretty muted returns for a lot of broad fixed income markets, uh, but things like high yields and tips did well. So your exposure there certainly helped. And if I move to the plan itself, starting on page 24. Um, so here you see 4.9 billion in assets. Uh, that's up about 200 million from uh, June 30th. Um, that 200 million increase is basically two thirds from inflows and one third from investment gains. Uh, and you see the allocations are close to a uh, policy target. On page 25, uh, there's, so there's you know more muted returns here for the quarter in absolute terms, but still ahead of benchmarks and top quartile in the peer group. Uh, that's for the quarter. Uh, for the one year, also strong numbers versus benchmarks. Um, I'd highlight public equity here kind of in the middle uh, for the one year period. Uh, some nice alpha from the managers with 140 basis points of outperformance versus the index. Uh, and I'll highlight one of those uh, here on page 30. Uh, at the very top here, you see artists in global opportunities. It's one of the larger weights to a single manager in the portfolio at, at 7%. Um, and it did really well um, here, you know, top decile for the quarter and also top decile since inception. Um, so some great stock selection from artisan. On page 31, um, I'll just highlight emerging markets as a whole. If you look at the gray bar, you see some nice alpha 
uh, versus the benchmark for the quarter as well as for the year. Um, a lot of that likely due to underweights to China, uh, which is something that Christina mentioned in a previous meeting. Um, and I'll skip ahead to page 45, just to look at and has made this march toward 5 billion. Um, so this is some of the numbers that I recapped earlier. You see 140 million of net cash inflows um, and another strong healthy gain of 56 million investment gains to end up close to 4.9 billion. And then finally, I'll stop comments on page 53, just to look at the three-year history here. I know we talk about this, this page um, a lot, but the three-year history is very impressive in terms of being top third for the peer group in performance, um, but also much stronger than the, than the peer group in, in a standard deviation as well. So putting the two together, you get a top quintile sharp ratio number. And then as we've also touched on before, if you just look at downside risk of the fund, um, top decile showing in Sortino ratio. So I'll stop comments there and see if anybody has any questions. Uh, thanks, floor is open, anybody? Uh, thanks, Jared, back to you, Prabhu, to go back to Makita. Okay, I'll uh, keep going if that's okay. Um, so here's the healthcare trust that we'll cover quickly. Um, on page 22, uh, we have total assets of 275 million, it's up 80 million from a year ago. Um, the allocations are closer to target, as Jay mentioned uh, to us. Uh, September 30th shows an overweight to cash and an underweight to real estate, but the following day on October 1st, um, that adjusted itself because cash went to capital calls to core real estate. So the allocations are, in fact, closer than this, this may. Go. On page 23, um, we have returns slightly behind the benchmark, uh, but still impressive, you know, top quartile or so if you look at year to date and beyond. And a lot of that, as we've mentioned, is because this plan is more aggressively positioned than many in this space. Um, as far as telling the benchmark itself, uh, you know, at the attribution is somewhat limited in how it's able to calculate and explain differences, but um, some of it was an underweight to real estate. Uh, which as of October 1st, that, that underweight was, was brought up. And then also some underperformance from the commodity strategy. Um, but if I just stop here on page 27, you can see some of the details of the commodity strategy. It didn't do as well for, for some of these more recent periods, but it has done quite well on a relative basis over longer periods. Um, so with that, I'll see if there's any questions on the healthcare trust. Great, floor's open. Any questions uh, for Jared? Uh, if not, uh, back to you, Prabhu. You want to wrap up with any comments there? Uh, no comments at this time, Chairman. I'm happy to take um, any questions from trustees. Any, any floors open? Anybody want to query Prabhu about what we just heard? Uh, usual excellent job, Jared, Laura, Casey, as always, it's really a pleasure to have you on our team. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on your team. I think, uh, Drew, if I may just, uh, just make jump in, yeah. Uh, so the, the thing I would say, Prabhu, is maybe next, as we go into asset allocation for next year, um, maybe we spend a little more time on the healthcare trust, uh, you know, compared to what we usually do, uh, because it seems to have at least a measure of underperformance uh, compared to the plan. Yes, uh, we will be. Yeah, we can certainly spend some time talking about that. Yes. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, great. This is um, obviously going to be a pretty short meeting if you read the agenda. We don't um, have any old business to continue. I know that the city has applied uh, to the court for permission to issue a pension bond, whether they will or won't, um, is a whole other matter. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That's from Virgil. Um, thanks for reminding me. Uh, by the way, the floor is open. When I open the floor, if the public has any comments, I, I, I would expect to see um, some of the public raise a hand, per se, uh, or to just jump in. Um, I'll, thanks, Roberto. Keep reminding me to do that. Um, no old business. So, new business, Roberto, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. I hope that uh, you all had a, a very uh, good Thanksgiving. 
uh, report this morning will be uh, somewhat short. Um, as you know, the retiree uh, open enrollment uh, took place during the month of November. Um, I believe it went uh, smoothly compared to some of the challenges last year when there was a change in providers. Uh, bottom line was uh, we did have uh, staff not only at the office, but also obviously working remotely uh, to answer questions. We received about 700 open enrollment change forms. Uh, about 60% of those uh, change forms were really health and dental in lieu. Those are members that are entitled to the healthcare benefit, but because they're covered under someone else, they just uh, request the in lieu someone uh, somewhat of as a credit. So in the future, when they start using it, they can they can have that credit. And the only 40% were actual uh, health, dental, and vision uh, changes. Um, I also wanted to let you know that just this week on Monday, we welcome a new benefits staff specialist, uh, Gretel uh, Calderon. So welcome to the team, Gretel. We look forward to working with you. Um, we do have some vacant positions. We still have to staff specialist positions. Uh, and we do have two positions in uh, information technology, uh, including uh, a network analyst. And so with the city lifting the hiring freeze, uh, we certainly are working diligently on the process with um, HR at the city to start the process of uh, searching for those uh, four positions. Uh, the city also just recently um, send out some uh, procedures on, um, on vaccination requirements for uh, vendors. And so we are starting that process of requesting the information from our vendors or contractors to have it available for the city. Also wanted to mention that uh, with the holiday coming on, uh, the city, uh, our offices, which are actually not open yet, they will remain closed for the December 23rd and 24th days and December 30th and 31st with actually holidays on the, the city uh, calendar. Uh, we'll, we'll have a, a very a small staff here uh, for the closure of the week of December 27th, 28th, uh, 27th, 28th, and 29th. Um, lastly, I wanted to mention a couple of things. One, as you know, um, we're still working with uh, the city clerk on, on uh, filling the position that was uh, vacated with uh, from uh, the resignation uh, of one of your uh, longest tenure uh, members, Vincent Seri. So we're still working with the city clerk on, on, on that process. And also um, the uh, seat for the police active, Dave Wilson, uh, is coming up. Uh, on November, November 30th. Um, uh, I believe he reapplied for the position. Uh, the city clerk is going to kick off the process right after that, and he will remain a trustee until um, either he's reappointed or in, uh, depending on how many uh, members are applying, uh, if he's not reappointed, then whenever the city uh, council appoints uh, a new member. And, and lastly, I, I share with all of you um, a couple of weeks ago, a communication that I sent out to our staff on our thoughts on, on how we're going to slowly but surely work our way back to the office. Uh, most of the staff is working remotely, starting with this week, November 29th. I requested that staff, uh, to the extent possible, try to at least uh, go to the office one day a week. Uh, we are still very flexible from the standpoint that if we have any staff that have any potential issues uh, or um, you know that that they're not able to attend the office, we're working with them to make sure that they can continue working remotely. Also, the office continue uh, being closed. But again, we do have a small staff here on a daily basis, and we are also uh, implementing the appointment process. So we are actually, in fact, accepting appointments uh, 
uh, through online or by phone from members. So when that happens and a member shows up at the office, we open the door for them. The goal is to, again, have staff come back to the office one day a week for the month of December. And starting in January, we will migrate to two days a week um, until we get this process correctly. Um, the, the office is not open yet, but depending on how that works out in January, uh, at some point and the appointment process, at some point we are possibly going to be opening um, to the public, even if it's not the eight to five, uh, a, a more uh, concise number of hours from like 10 to two or 10 to three. Of course, you all heard of the most recent um, COVID-19 variant. So again, this is a very fluid situation. Uh, if you remember my communication, I indicated that we certainly are gonna be keeping track of COVID-19 so that if anything changes, as you know, in the U.S., they discovered the first case uh, yesterday in California, which I believe it was actually here in the Bay Area. And so we will keep you posted. Uh, if we make any changes to those plans, we certainly share that not only with our members and the public, but also with uh, all of you. Uh, with that, um, that concludes my uh, update, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, great. Floor's open. Anybody have anything? Yeah, yeah Mr. Chair, Dick Santos. Sure, jump in, Dick. Yeah, to uh, Roberto. I uh, got the pamphlets, uh, you know, in the mail. Talks about our benefits. Talk about some of uh, your personnel and their background. I thought they were very, very helpful. Everything seems to be going well in communication with the retirees. We want to say thank you, Roberto, and you and the staff. Thank you, Dick. We, we, we are glad to hear that. I think you're referring to the quarterly newsletter, and of course, we're going to be sending a new one uh, next month, which we are planning to include uh, um, staff from the investment function, as well as uh, providing some update on our plans, uh, bringing staff back to the office. So thank you. We appreciate that. Today. So you're welcome. And also, when it comes to this, uh, I think this uh, call Medicare B, where we get some reimbursement, I think we have to give the Social Security uh, part B, uh, that needs to be publicized uh, as much as you can prior to turning that in. Very well. Thank Good you. point. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Great. Floor still open. Any other questions for Roberto? Uh, if not, I see uh, Pam, I see Councilwoman uh, Pam Foley, our council liaisons out there. Over to you, Pam. Thank you, Drew. Good morning, everyone. And Happy Thanksgiving a week late. I hope you all enjoyed your time with family and friends and time off for a few days. Um, just we, we're moving into a really busy council session as we wrap up before the end of the year. The uh, what, Some of the things that we're working on is redistricting is really a, a big topic right now. We have three public hearings. The first one was held this uh, just this Tuesday, November 30th. The next one is on the 7th and followed by one on the 14th. The decision on the redistricting, there are three maps that are being presented, although two are really uh, gaining any type of input from the community. And one is called the community map. The other is called the unity map. So we're taking a look at how they impact our various districts and of course we're all looking to our uh, self-interest not our self-interest but the self-interest of our district to see how much uh, we gain or lose every district must or at least my district is one of the lower uh, resident counts because there's not a lot of development in district nine so i'm going to have to gain about six thousand residents other districts have uh, gained a lot of residents in the last 10 years, and so they'll need to lose in order to balance out the maps where every district has approximately 100,000 representation. So the I haven't made a decision on the maps one way or the other. There are good points in both the community map and the unity map, and there's some uh, problems on both maps as well. So it'll be, I look forward to what the committee the city council has to say when we get a chance to weigh in we haven't had that opportunity yet 
The other thing, a um, couple other things at the district or at the city level is SB9. You may have heard about that. That's the state law that the governor passed or signed into law, but we must implement by January 1st. And what SB9 requires is that lots of, I think, 2,500 square feet, that's the parcel size, can be split in two and duplexes can be constructed on both sides of the new lot split. Uh, we will on December 14th, this is, this is a concern for many in our communities as they don't wanna see higher density without consideration for infrastructure, water, power, parking, uh, all of those considerations are, are concerned. And, and then there's also in SB9, a lack of public engagement, uh, which is critical to my community and most of those in San Jose, but in um, the SB9, it doesn't require any community outreach, which is really, really unfortunate. So city council has to implement it, but how we implement it is up to us slightly. We'll find out in a week or so what that really means. But there, uh, I think the, the fear or the concerns about SB9 are not necessarily real yet because the cost to buy land or buy a property and then split it is expensive. And then the cost to develop is expensive. So I don't think there's gonna be a rush for lot splits in San Jose, at least in parts of them, but it, there may be, we'll have to see what we decide as a council. I bring that to you just as an area of information. The other thing, and uh, Roberto brought this up a little bit is in his uh, looking to fill staffing positions, that is a chronic problem throughout the city. <clears throat> We're losing staff to uh, retirement. We're losing staff to additional uh, neighboring jurisdictions who can pay more. Uh, we have a hard working staff that we need to figure out a way to retain. And we also need to figure out a way to recruit. There are certain areas like code enforcement, like planning, uh, other areas, the Department of Transportation have huge uh, retirements or people who've left that are causing flows of work, work to be really diminished. So I'm working with the city manager's office to try to come up with creative ideas on recruiting and retention. So if you have any ideas, please let me know. The final thing I will leave you with is that, uh, thank you, Drew, for the letter from you regarding mental health benefits for our retirees. We have, I have discussed that with the city manager and um, her uh, chief city manager, uh, assistant city manager, Lee Wilcox. And there are some steps we have to work through that we're working through. And, you know, like any government thing, I don't expect a quick response, but Thank you for the letter that will be helpful and we're gonna, going to continue to work for, through it. Still, there is some question whether that initial benefit needs to bargain, be bargained, whether the voters need to approve it. There's a lot of different things, but I, I don't want you to think that I've lost attention on it. It's on the forefront of one of my policy issues. So I'll keep pushing and trudging along with that. With that, I wish you all a happy holiday and we'll take any questions if you have any. Um, that's good. Floor is open. Let me jump in real quick. For those of you that don't know, Pam started off by talking about SB9, and you can split lots. And you may think, oh, great, Sacramento's up to stuff. But it was a very interesting um, bill. And like the bill before it that granted accessory dwelling unit rights, there's. I just reread the bill. There is a ministerial fiat provision, just so you guys know. It's why Pam brought this up that forces San Jose and the County of Santa Clara to grant these permits. And I think it's, you might know, Pam, if the city or county drags their feet and doesn't grant it within, I think it's six months, then you can just go ahead and build, right? And there, that's what ministerial. Uh, I don't know that, Drew. So, <laughs> that, yeah. you know, we have, we will adopt something yeah. where we do have flexibility is setbacks and potentially other areas. People are really concerned that we're gonna be, that people will be able to divide lots, build a duplex on each side, and then two ADUs. 
I've oh. heard conflicting information from that uh, by from real estate attorneys who haven't come down whether that's accurate or not. So it's it's very it's a concern because it takes away the local control over these development issues um, and makes it a ministerial process as Drew said, but I wasn't familiar with the six months. So, but we're gonna yeah. adopt something. So we're not gonna let that happen. Yeah, great. Floor's open, any questions uh, for Pam? Mr. Chair, Dick yeah. Santa. Uh, jump in, Dick. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, council member Foley, thank you for that brief and excellent report. I know your plate is full uh, we go through the same thing in the water district in terms of redistricting. You can't make everybody happy. It's a difficult job. SB9 is also, you're right about having infrastructure. So I, God bless you when making the decisions. But I want to make a comment. During all that tough decisions you're making, you have time to be sensitive to the retirees' need about these benefits in terms of uh, recent deaths and things that are happening to the retirees. We want to say thank you for keeping it going. It's very sensitive, it's a very difficult. I know it always takes funding, but we appreciate you staying on top of this. Thank you. Thank you, Dick, I appreciate that. It's Great, important. anything else for Councilman Foley? Uh, if not, um, uh, Roberto, I'll leave it over to you if you wanna make any introductions before you kick off Chiron. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, today we have two items uh, to be presented by Chiron. Uh, the first one, which is 4C, is the preliminary pension valuation results based on your board economic assumptions, decisions at your last meeting. That will be presented by Bill Hallmark. And then the second one is the discussion and action on other post-employment benefits, methods, and assumptions to be presented by Chiron, uh, Michael, so that uh, your board can make those uh, decisions and uh, Chiron can go ahead and perform the preliminary valuation for the healthcare plan. And as you may recall, this is the year that also we have Seagull Company, another, um, a, a, another company that does actually work uh, auditing uh, the work and the process by Chiron on both plans, pension and healthcare. And so you will be hearing from Seagull uh, next year in January and February on their uh, audits for the pension plan and the healthcare. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Bill. Uh, welcome, Bill. Good to see you. So it's out there. Ann, you're out there too. They were on just a minute ago. No, hey, Bill, Bill was there. I can't see him. Uh, it's Bill, step Bill is frozen. Oh, Bill's frozen. Oh, there we go. Can you? Oh, hi, Ann. Hi. How are you? Good. Well, I guess Bill's got to reboot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm looking. Yeah, we can we can just uh, um, hey, but let's take a let's take a quick five minute break. Uh, anybody want to grab something, a cup of coffee, or or a uh, bio break? Let's take five minutes. Uh, we'll reconvene at nine forty. It's nine thirty six right now. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ann. Thanks.
no worries, Bill. We we need a bio break anyway. And Anne was ready to step in, but but we gave her a reprieve. <laughs> All right, over to you, Bill and Ann. All right, just a minute here. Let me get the screen up. All right, thank you. Um, we're here uh, this morning to present the preliminary pension valuation results. Uh, we're ahead of our normal schedule. I'll run through the, the schedule right now. Um, but uh, so we're not doing the full valuation presentation, but we'll present the preliminary results. Uh, we'll focus a lot on what's changed over the last year and looking at some of the differences between tier one and tier two. Uh, we'll defer most of our projections to the next uh, meeting when we'll have the full valuation report and we'll discuss risk and all of those uh, sorts of issues. Uh, just as a reminder of our uh, five board meetings that uh, where we have actuarial items, uh, we started back in October reviewing the um, economic assumptions. And then in November, we reviewed the, the demographic assumptions and made final decisions on all of those pension assumptions. So today we have the preliminary valuation results for the pension, but uh, as Roberto was saying in his introduction, we're also gonna review the assumptions for the OPEB plan in the next agenda item. Uh, and we will need decisions from the board on those assumptions so that we can move forward. Uh, in January, we'll be back with the final uh, pension valuation report, and we will have the preliminary OPEB valuation. And then in February, uh, as Roberto had mentioned, Siegel is doing an actuarial audit. We expect their audit results uh, for that February board meeting along with our final OPEB valuation report. So uh, just as a reminder, when we're doing the valuation, uh, the primary output of the valuation is the contributions. Uh, but we have to look at the whole system we have here. And, and over time, we need the contributions plus the investment earnings to equal the expenses and the benefits. Uh, and so when we do the valuation, we start by looking at the plan provisions, the census data, and all of our assumptions to project out the benefits and expenses that are gonna be paid in the future. Then we use actuarial methods to determine the funding target, which can be thought of as the size of this tank, and compare that to the asset levels in the, in the tank. Uh, and then, we know what we need for the future, and that is split between the investment earnings and the contributions. And we have our funding policy that tells us how we're gonna turn these dials for the employer and employee contributions to adjust each year. So this year, um, we had exceptional investment returns, as we've been talking about for several months. And that has had a significant impact. Uh, this chart on the left shows the liability as uh, bars broken out between the status of the uh, members. So the blue bars represent the liability for members who are currently receiving benefits. The little gold slice is for members who are no longer working uh, for the city, but are entitled to a benefit in the future. And the red is for the active members. Then the, uh, the green line is the market value of assets, and the teal line is the actuarial value of assets. And so on a market value basis for the whole system, we went from 71% funded to 87% funded in this last year. On an actuarial value basis, we went from 74% funded to 78% funded. We went from the actuarial value being higher than the market value to now being uh, substantially below the market value. And so uh, we'll talk about that 
um, process and dynamic uh, a little bit more later. On the right-hand side, you can see the breakout between tier one and tier two. Uh, and so a couple things to note here. The system is still very much dominated by tier one. Uh, the actuarial liability for tier one far outstrips the actuarial liability for tier two. And so the funded status of tier one it is pretty much the funded status of the whole system. It's slightly different, uh, but this is the big uh, unfunded liability that we're trying to pay off. Uh, it's been reduced on a market value basis. We cut it in half this year with the exceptional investment returns. Uh, we haven't recognized all of those yet in, in the actuarial value of assets. And so um, that improvement is more gradual. I would note uh, tier two is well over 100% funded. On a market value basis, it's almost 125% funded. Uh, on an actuarial value, it's over 110% funded. Contributions. Uh, I don't think we've uh, presented a, a contribution picture like this before, because uh, since 2010, we've been building contributions up to pay off the unfunded liability. Um, but this year we're seeing uh, a significant reduction in the total city contribution from 87% down to 81% of pay. And on a dollar basis, it goes down as well from uh, 217 to 211 million. What, what's changed? Well, the member rates and the city normal cost rate, that's the cost of benefits attributable to the next year of service, are, are remaining relatively flat Those uh, as a percent of pay. There's a shift as we go from tier one to tier two where the members are paying more and the city is paying less of a proportion of that. Um, that's a gradual shift that we expect to continue for, for uh, quite a few years. Uh, on a dollar basis, as the payroll grows, we do see uh, the dollar amount of those normal costs growing, but they are relatively stable. The big change is the UAL payment and primarily the tier one UAL payment. Uh, we split that UAL payment between the interest on the UAL and the uh, principal payment on the UAL. The principal payment is the amount that's actually going to reduce the UAL. If you just contribute the interest, the UAL would stay the same as a dollar amount. So um, with the exceptional returns, the interest on that UAL drops substantially. It's dropped dramatically on a market rate basis. And so that means more of our contribution can go towards paying off the principal of the UAL uh, as we're bringing the contribution down gradually. And that, that same thing is true uh, as a percent of pay and as a dollar amount. So, um, with the exceptional returns, part of the reason we're paying off so much of that principal on the UAL is that we smooth the assets. So we're not reducing the contribution as quickly. Uh, we, it smooths out the effect of volatile investment returns on contributions. And so I wanted to talk through um, how we develop the actuarial value of assets uh, we haven't gone in detail on this for a while, uh, and you can see from this, part of the reason is it hasn't made a significant difference for a while. Uh, the actuarial value and market value have been very close. But the process is we look at the actual investment returns each year compared to what we expected based on the discount rate. 
And, and so you can see for 2017, we expected about 293 million in, or we got 293 million in return. We expected 213. So that difference of $80 million was our gain uh, for the year. And, and you can see similar thing, uh, differences across the board. 2021 is really an outlier where the actual return was over a billion and we only expected 250 million. So that's uh, quite a difference. On the right-hand side, we're showing how we split that difference. So in 2017, 80 million, all the way to 2021, where it was almost 800 million. How we split that between what we recognized in the actuarial value and what's deferred to be recognized in the future. And everything from five years ago is fully recognized in this valuation. And then 80% from four years ago, 60% from uh, three years ago, 40% from 2020, and only 20% in 2021. So this dark green area is the portion of the almost 800 million that we recognized in the actual value of assets. Um, and, and so there is this large piece that's unrecognized that we will recognize in the next uh, four valuations. Here on the left-hand side, we're just showing the actual calculation. So you can see uh, how things are um, put together, uh, split for tier one and tier two. So just kind of walking through the tier one column, we had a, a market value of about 4.6 billion. The investment uh, gain was 781 million, but we deferred about 625 million of that. And, and so forth for 2020, uh, where we're deferring 60%. 2019, we're deferring 40%. 2018, we're deferring 20%. And we're not deferring anything for 2017. So if you add up all of the deferred lines here, you get that we have $507 million in asset gains that we're deferring to the future. And so our actuarial value this year is only 4.1 billion for tier one instead of the 4.6 billion uh, in market value. Now the point of doing that is to smooth out volatility. And so the slide here on the right, the chart on the right shows the actuarial assets in green and the market assets in blues. So you can see how uh, the market assets have bounced around and the actuarial assets follow a smoother path. That smoother path then leads to smoother contributions so that we don't have large disruptions in the city's budget from year to year. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it to Ian to walk you through some of the, the details in evaluation. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to continue on with some more good news, fortunately, um, looking at the membership trends. Um, what we see here is the membership counts. In blue, we have the active membership split between the tier one, which is the dark blue, and then tier two is the teal color. And then the deferred vesteds are in gold. Those are members who are no longer active but are not yet in pay status. And then the green bars represent those members who are currently in pay status. Um, the red line is a calculation that's called the support ratio of the number of inactives compared to the number of active members. And you can see that of starting in uh, 2021, this has increased dramatically over that 20 year period, mostly because the active membership uh, decreased by about 25% while we saw almost a doubling of the members in pay status during that same time. But let, me so jump in, let me jump in real quick. And sure. for those of you who are new trustees, it was this observation really kind of almost panic button hit by Chiron 
that triggered us to have a slightly more conservative um, investment strategy than other plans. So you're you're sort of seeing um, a little bit deja vu. Keep going, Anne. Right. Yes. Um, but uh, the good news is that since 2017, the active membership has been increasing, and uh, you're see, you see that support ratio line declining in 2018 and kind of stabilizing over the next few years here. Um, from 2020 to 2021, there was an increase in the active membership of about uh, about 30 members. So that again, that support ratio did stabilize. And like Drew was saying, you know, why is this important? Uh, what what does this ratio mean? And it's basically that the active members, the payroll, is the basis for the plan member contributions. So it becomes more challenging to support the inactive liabilities with a relatively smaller payroll base in, in making your plan more sensitive to, uh, to changes in investments and liabilities because of that. Here we're showing uh, the changes in the UAL and it is based on the actuarial value of assets. On the left-hand side, um, you can see that the uh, UAL from 2020 was about 1.4 billion and it decreased to about 1.2 billion or about $166 million. Uh, the biggest driver of that change was your, your investment gains, um, uh, which totaled 117 million. Um, and then the second biggest driver here is those contributions uh, uh, over the tread water level. Um, and again, that's the amount of contributions that are above the normal cost and in interest on the UAL. It's what is paying off your unfunded liability. And that's a, a relatively large chunk uh, going towards un paying down the unfunded. Um, there was a small liability loss of $7 million. And then also the assumption changes from the demographic side decreased the UAL by about 2 million. Um, over on the right-hand side, we kind of blew up that $7 million uh, of the liability experience to show the source components of what makes up that uh, liability loss. Um, the biggest driver here was salaries increased a little bit more than we anticipated, and that was offset uh, by a mortality gain, um, which means, unfortunately, that we had more deaths than were expected. And we don't know whether or not that was COVID-driven, but it's pretty, it's very in line with what we're seeing nationally of about 15 to 20% excess deaths. But again, it didn't really translate to a, a large gain. It's just a small gain there. Um, and when you look historically over the last five years, the main driver of these liability gains and losses is the salary uh, component with salaries are increasing or decreasing more than we anticipated. Um, but it does balance out over the bargaining cycle. Like one year you see a big gain, uh, like in 2017, or I'm sorry, it's a loss in 2017. And then the next year you see a gain. So that does, it is balancing out with those uh, bargaining cycles. Here, we're looking at the full UAL again, and that liability loss that we were just talking about, you can see in 2021 was very, very small at 7 million. And the liability experience does uh, make up the smallest portion of change in the UAL besides some, some slight benefit changes in the past. The total liability experience over this 10 year period increased the UAL by about $93 million. Um, the investment returns and assumption changes are both very similar in magnitude and in increasing the UAL over time. The actual value was about $480 million increase in the UAL. Um, and you can see most of that has been a result in the last 11 years. Almost all of those were losses that have accumulated, but you can see in 2021 that it was a relatively large gain for the year. And this is on an actuarial value basis. So you're going to see similar uh, gains over the next four years if the assets return around 6.6% every year for the next four years. You're going to have all those deferred gains that Bill was talking about of about five or $600 million. Um, so that's good news. And we'll show you those uh, projections at the, our next meeting. But you can look forward to uh, that buffer over the next four years. 
Um, Just to put a point on that, the 2012 and 13 losses also had a piece of the 2009 loss that right. were going forward. So um, you, you can see those effects. We don't know what the returns will be going forward, but we'll have, we've got a bunch of gains in the banking. Right. Um, so there were slight decreases in the UAL due to some benefit changes. Uh, back in 2012, the SRBR was eliminated. And then in 2017, there was a slight increase due to the changes for Measure F. Um, again, significant is this contribution treadwater uh, level concept where you're paying large chunks of the UAL principal based on your contribution um, effort right now. And you can see that in 2021, it was, we said it was about 50 million. Um, and that dramatic change from this valuation, from uh, last year's valuation to this year's valuation that Bill showed earlier, you're going to see that red bar increasing as well over time because of the amount that's gonna go towards paying down the unfunded, that's gonna increase as well. So. Going forward, it's just, we're gonna sh be showing a lot of really good news because of those asset gains um, that have been deferred and also that the contributions uh, going towards the UIL are going to increase as well based on your funding policy. So tier one versus tier two, we're gonna take a look at some of the differences in, in the tiers here. On the left-hand side, we have the membership counts and then on the right, the payroll. And for membership, the tier one makes up over 80% of the plan membership. Um, and that's because the retirees are still just over 50% of, of the plan's membership. And then tier two does make up about 40% of the active membership. Um, their the plan total is about 15%, but they are close to 40% of the, the counts uh, as of 2021 valuation. Um, however, their payroll is just slightly less than 40% because the tier one, they're younger and have less service, so they have a, their pay is slightly less than the tier uh, one actives who make up 62% of the payroll. So looking at the uh, liabilities now and the, and the assets, it shows a slightly different picture. Um, tier one makes up almost 99% of the actual liability still. And that's for two reasons, because of the inactives, um, who are all tier one members, the, the ones that are in pay status make up close to 70% of that accrued liability. And then uh, tier one actives, um, they, are, uh, they make up 28% of the total, but they are about 15 years older on average and have 15 more years of service than the uh, tier two actives. So that's why their liability is such a much larger portion of the liability, even though they're only 60% of the total uh, active membership. And then when you look at the market value of assets, it's similar to the liabilities where tier one makes up 98% of the market value of assets and tier two only 2%. So it's not surprising that 90% of the city's contributions are going toward uh, tier are going toward uh, membership for the tier one. Um, and so looking at these tier one contributions, you can see that the city total went from uh, $203 million to $194 million. So that's a decrease of $9 million. And that is mostly in the decrease in that UAL payment of a which decreased by about 7 million for the tier one. Um, and then the normal cost also decreased about $2 million for tier one. And that's because there are just less uh, tier one active membership or tier one members from last year um, as they leave and retire. Um, and then for tier one, the member contribution rate is from last year to this year actually increased about 17 basis points. Then turning to tier two, um, there the city total contribution uh, increased slightly, about $3 million, and that's just because there's more members in tier uh, two now. Um, the tier two member rates actually declined slightly, about 10 basis points, 
Um, and that's because tier two is allocated a portion of the UAL, the members in tier two are allocated a portion of the UAL payment. But in this case, as Bill had uh, discussed earlier, is that the tier two, uh, they're fully funded. So that's not a UAL payment, they get an offsetting UAL credit. So that decreased their contribution rate. Uh, it was a net decrease for them about 10 basis points in the member contribution for tier two members. Um, this is this is Roberta. Big question for you. And can you say that again about tier two? And can you explain why that is the case? Sure. Um, so tier two members um, pay fifty percent of their normal cost, um, whereas tier one members pay three eighths of the normal cost. And then tier two members also pay fifty percent of the UAL where tier one members do not pay any of the UAL. So going that big decrease that we saw in the UAL this year actually translated to a decrease in the tier two member rates where you're not seeing that for tier one. So there was a slight increase in the total normal cost rate for tier two, but it got offset by a bigger UAL credit for them because of the asset experience. On this too, okay. So uh, this slide breaks out the contributions into the components that the city needs for their budgeting process and projects them for five years. It's the only projection we have in here. Um, the percent of pay for each year is shown in the left column and dollar amounts in the right column. Uh, so you can see the, the individual rates for tier one and tier two for police and fire for the members and how those are projected uh, going forward. I should note, there is a minimum contribution rate of equal to the normal cost. So the UAL reduction for tier two uh, only goes to pay off the administrative expenses. It doesn't um, go more negative than that. Um, so there is a minimum equal to the normal cost. But you can see that the normal cost, uh, not counting administrative expenses, is uh, slightly lower. And so we're uh, projecting some slight reductions in the tier two contributions. The tier one is just uh, three elevenths of the normal cost. There is a uh, slight um, UAL payment for some of the uh, Measure F pieces. And there's an uh, old uh, police uh, change that has a very small uh, UAL payment for police tier one members, which I think is paid off after 2023, which is why you get this reduction between 20 and 2024. But I think for the board, the main thing uh, I want to point out here is what the projection is at the bottom. Uh, we're going from 87% down to 81% this year. The projection is to have significant steps down over the next five years, 72%, 64, 58, 51%. And that's a combination of recognizing um, the investment returns from this last year. And so it, and paying off some amortizations uh, in the process. So finishing payments on some layers of the amortization. The dollar amount also goes down significantly. By the end of the five years, it's a $60 million reduction in the city's contribution. So that's quite substantial. Now, all of that assumes that we get 6.625% returns each and every year, and all of our other assumptions are met. So we know there's going to be variation on that, but I think um, the thing to keep in mind is that those banked uh, investment gains provide significant downward pressure on the contribution rates over the next four years. So we can ex 
uh, we will come back and show you the sensitivity of that uh, going forward to other scenarios and what it would take for the contributions to go back up. But um, in the near term, there's significant downward pressure on city contribution rates because of those investment returns. Well, can I ask a quick question here? Yeah, I was just going to open it up to questions. Oh, um, I think you just made a point, which I just want to make sure I sort of understand. You said, uh, I mean, it sounds like there's about $516 million of what I call a reserve from your, one of your previous slides mm -hmm. for future losses, so to speak. When you say that it, this, this assumes we continue to make 6.625% 6, 6 in the future, is it after accounting for the amortization of that $516 million or? before? Uh, so these projections are taking into account the recognition of that 516 million over the next four years. Okay. And, and so it's assuming we get six and five eighths percent return on the market value of assets during that period so that we can fully recognize that 516 million over the next four years. Got it. So we have to make, we have to continue to make six and six and three eighths for the next um, four years to be able to recognize that 516 million. Is that? Yeah, I, I, I said that a little bit incorrectly. We will still recognize the 516, but we will also recognize pieces of any gain or loss that from investment returns that are different than six and five eighths. Got it, that's very helpful, thank you. Uh, very good points, Sunita. Thank you for the question. Um, Bill, obviously, you guys do outstanding work. I'm glad you <laughs> you sort of made the note that these numbers are based on the huge assumptions that, no pun intended here, that all the assumptions by the actuary are being met going forward. Um, I know this is part of the work that you guys do for the city. I just, you know, I, I do present um, the actual results to the city council every year. And, and this is a big, big, big uh, caution here because, wow, you know, the last thing I wanted to do is start thinking that rates are going to be going down up to $60 million for the next five years, you know, not that it could not happen. And I certainly will talk to Prabhu and make sure that uh, he earned uh, six and uh, five eights for the next five years. I know Prabhu can do that. Um, but, you know, in the unlikely event that we had, a, we have a bad, bad year going forward, just as good as we had it now, then all those numbers are out. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that is correct. Bill lost connection, he said again, but that is correct. See, I, I, I'm starting to take I'm a person out here. Whenever I'm talking, Bill, hang on. <laughs> no, no I'm here. I think that went through late. I'm still here. Okay, Thank well, no, that is correct. Um, the one point just to make, though, is that um, the, the effect of the 2021 gain was so substantial um, that it would take a very big loss. Yes, to, it's even a loss to, to, yeah. to throw all these numbers. Right. I mean, right. we do know that markets are gonna go up and down. So right. I, I do appreciate it. And I know this is part of the work that is required. I just think that the, the, you know, the numbers <laughs> are so sizable, right? Over the next five years that uh, I think it's important that we sort of throw right. that caution when we speak publicly about it, which, which Bill right. just did. I'm not saying that he didn't. Right. I'm just kind of reinforcing that, that's all, thank right. you. And well, I think and yeah. one of the things we've talked about potentially doing is um, the city requests these five year projections for their budgeting purposes. And perhaps rather than just providing the single projection, we might provide them, uh, in addition to this projection, kind of a range uh, to give them some idea of the potential range of contributions depending on investment returns. Because we've talked about how sensitive this plan is to those investment returns. It works both with great returns and poor returns. So we've cautioned more about the 
poor returns and the risks there. But part of what we're seeing here in these projections is how sensitive the plan's contributions are to exceptional returns as well. Uh, floor is open. If you guys have any questions for Bill or Ann, just jump in. Nobody else wants to go. I have a couple other things. Yeah, jump in, Sunita. Okay, so I, I guess um, if I were to develop an intuition around, you know, what kind of loss, maybe you are going into this later, but um, going back to this $516 million reserve that's been created thanks to 2021 and 2020 and 21 returns. Um, if we look at the asset base, that's about, a, you know, something like 11, 12% loss. Uh, you know, if just simply to wipe that out, so to speak, and increase contributions. Is that a reasonable intuition? Uh, roughly, yes. That Now that's from the 6.625. So it's not a minus 11% return. But then the pattern of that recognition would not match up with the pattern of the current. 516 million. So it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't directly eliminate uh, it all going forward. And so right. when, so when, when we have the when we come back next month with the model and, and those things, we can run those scenarios for you and show you uh, how the pattern works. But what you if you got an 11 percent loss this year you would probably still see contributions going down for the next couple of years, but then they would turn and start to uh, go back up um, to something closer to what we are now. Yeah, it makes sense. I guess you'll smooth that as well, so. Right. Yeah. Uh, one, other, one other last question was, I really liked slide 10, which was really, you know, very well. The whole presentation was fantastic particularly uh, side ten, slide 10, I was curious, um, uh, uh, do you have uh, any sense on the, the 550, 452 million assumption change that caused uh, sort of an increase in UALs? What primarily drove that? Is it essentially the discount rate or are there other things that... Um, the vast majority is the discount rate. There were uh, other changes um, I think part of the change in 2015 was uh, mortality. Um, so it, there, there have been other changes, including retirement rates and uh, mortality that have contributed to that, but the vast majority is the discount rate. Right. And the discount rate back in 2012 was 7.25%. So it's been a substantial decrease since that to 6.625. That's a very good point. Okay, thank you. Uh, floor still open. Any other questions? I have a question actually. I'm Ben Maytack. So Bill and um, Ann, so this is just a preliminary um, uh, summary of the data and you guys are coming back in January to prov provide the final valuation report. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Do you expect there to be much changes in the data that you have presented today? Is there any sort of incompleteness that we should, you know, consider or is this kind of priming the pump for the January um, presentation? Um, we, we don't expect any changes. Uh, we haven't um, completed all the reviews. We've completed most of the reviews of the results. Okay. And so Siegel is conducting their audit simultaneously. As well. Okay. I'm just trying to get a sense of whether or not now is an appropriate time to take action on this or whether we should defer to January. Uh, I would recommend deferring to January for the final uh, report. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to add to that. Thank you for the question, Maytag, and, and thank you, Bill, for the response. I do agree that you board should wait until January. Um, I, just as a side note to this, uh, obviously one of the uh, comments that I, I share or the request I share with Seagull and Kyron 
in preparation of the audits is, of course, um, I think the audit is a necessary evil. I think it needs to be done, and I think it's the right approach to make sure that every uh, so long we we sort of confirm that the process and the assumptions that your board is using based on Kyron's work are appropriate and having uh, another outstanding firm supporting that like Seagull uh, is certainly a, a very good approach and a, and a very good fiduciary responsibility and decision on your part. Uh, but one of my key issues here is, is uh, I told Seagull, hey, if for whatever reason, which by the way, I wanna make the point that I do not expect any big changes or so any uh, material findings in the audit, but Obviously, the last thing that I will want is for you board to approve a evaluation and then Siegel will come back and bring forward some sizable comments or material comments that could impact that decision. So I think uh, the longer we wait uh, so that Cameron have a chance to review it and we don't have any concerns by Siegel, I think the better we're off. So thank you for the question, Maytag, and I appreciate the response, uh, uh, Bill. So thank you. So the other, go ahead, Bill. I, I saw your email, Drew, and, and I would like to address that a little bit. So, hey, hey, Bill, uh, let's let's not let's not bring that up um, in public just yet. I, I'm sorry. Um, I'm starting an internal dialogue on a uh, board. I'm I'm doing something slightly confidential with our actuary um, and staff um, because it might be a wacky idea. Bill, is that okay if we sort of keep this off the well, record? I just wanted to make a comment about tier yeah, two. Go ahead, yeah. Not, not going into what to do about yeah. it. Um, but uh, tier two is young and growing rapidly. Yeah. And so this high funding ratio is not likely to last. Uh, okay. Even if all of our assumptions are met, if you doubled the liability and the assets, suddenly the funding ratio would drop. Yeah. Um, so uh, I would not treat, a, at this stage, I would not treat a tier two funding ratio, high funding ratio as yeah. a major topic. Yeah. If tier one was funded that way, it would be a major topic yeah. uh, because that's the, a uh, large part of the liability, and it is not growing. Um, yeah. So the that's kind of was part of the answer. And so just so the board knows, I reached out to, to Bill and Ann and Virtual and Peru and said, we keep talking about what happens when we get something more than 100% funded. When we get something more than 100% funded, what happens? And what, what Bill's saying is, yeah, Drew, but that's like 100% funded for a mature plan, and Tier 2 is not a mature plan. So part of this is just my education. Even though I've been on the board for over 10 years, we've never been in this situation before. Right, and I, I think one way to look at it is it's 125% funded, but that means it has a surplus of $17 million. Yeah. Which is really uh, nothing in the overall scheme of things. So we just need to keep the, the different size and different dynamics in, in mind. Um, here, but I think that's a good point because we don't want um, people to be, I don't know, jumping for joy at tier two's funded percentage. We like it being over 100%, but it's not the same as if the whole plan was over 100%. Yeah, yeah. Well, I should say, Bill, you know, and that's the advantage of having, um, you know, that's that curve that Ann showed, the red line. Um, we don't have any red line on this fund yet. Because I guess we probably have some have some tier two people retired. No, no. Oh, zero. So um great. Thanks, Bill. A floor is still open. Any more comments? Um, if not, usual excellent job, Bill and Ann. Thanks. We're gonna move on to um item four E election for the positions of chair and vice chair. Uh Harvey Maytag, any chair, reason why there's a chair? Yes, go uh, ahead. We, we need to do the open methods and assumptions now. Oh, okay. I, uh, thank you. you. Hang on. Give me a sec. Okay. 
you saw Michael there. He was he's so excited to speak to you about uh, <laughs> open. He said, "Oh, give me chance." <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. You're right. Sorry, I'm, I skipped that step. Go ahead. Um, let's do OPEP. Sorry, Robert. I totally missed that agenda. Okay, so uh, Mike and I are going to run through the assumptions here for the OPEP valuation. But before we get to the assumptions. It's working. Yeah. There we go. Um, I want to give a little background about the OPEB plan and how it's funded because uh, we talk so much about the pension and it's a little bit different uh, here for the OPEB. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the assumptions that are specific to the OPEB plan. We borrow the retirement rates, mortality, and all of those kinds of assumptions. Uh, we use the same assumptions as the pension plan. And, and this item is an action item. We do need some board decisions on this. Um, so the, the OPEB plan is mostly closed. It, and what I mean by that is the only members who can get the full benefits are tier one members who did not elect the VBA. Others can get a benefit uh, if they qualify for catastrophic disability, but that's a much smaller um, benefit because of the probabilities of qualifying for catastrophic disability. Uh, so the primary uh, benefit is for the, that closed group of tier one members. With uh, the measure F changes, Member contributions are now fixed at 8% of pay. So we as the board are not changing the dial on member contributions, regardless of what we do. Uh, it does not change the member contributions. The city contributions, however, are what we as the board set, subject to the city has the option to cap their contributions at 11% of pay. Last year was the first uh, valuation where the contributions exceeded 11% of pay uh, and the city opted not to impose their cap. So they, they paid the full contribution. So this valuation uh, develops the contribution for 2023, just like the pension plan. And then we also use it for financial reporting. Now, there are also two different types of subsidies provided in this plan. Uh, the explicit subsidy is what the board is mostly focused on because that's what's pre-funded through the trust. Uh, and the explicit subsidy is the plan pays the premium for health coverage that's selected by the retiree up to a maximum of 100% of the premium for the lowest cost plan that's offered to active employees. And so that sets the, the subsidy level that we try and pre-fund through the trust. Now, in addition to that, when you provide uh, retirees access to uh, the healthcare plans, uh, there is an implicit subsidy and the city pays for this on a pay-as-you-go basis. Uh, and it's the difference between the expected claims costs for the retirees and the total premiums paid. We use the same premiums for active employees and retirees who aren't eligible for the Medicare plans. So the, the pre-Medicare retirees, but the cost for healthcare varies by age. And so the retirees tend to be older than the active employees uh, as a whole. And so the costs of providing those retiree benefits are actually greater than the premiums that's charged. And that difference is the implicit subsidy. Now, we develop an expected, expected claims costs uh, combined with the federated plan. Uh, and calculate the implicit subsidy. And we disclose that amount in the funding valuation. 
And it's an integral part of the financial reporting under GASB for both the plan and the city. Uh, and so it's a part of that valuation. But really the focus of our funding valuation is what does the city need to contribute to the trust to fund the explicit subsidy? So we're not gonna spend much time on the implicit subsidy other than to recognize that it's there. I just wanna to touch on the valuation results from 2020. Uh, these are the contributions with the member in uh, purple and the city in gold. A uh, couple things I wanna note about the contributions. We've got police on the left, fire on the right. One is that that 8% of pay that the members pay uh, just about covers the normal cost. It's right about the same as the normal cost. So they're, the members are essentially paying for um, the additional uh, accrual of benefits. And the city's contribution is going to pay off the UAL. The contributions, we've been building them up, um, but there's still not enough uh, right now to be expected to reduce the UAL. The other thing I want to note here is the size difference, because this graph is scaled for the OPEB plan, uh, and we just went through the pension plan. Uh, if you add the city's contribution for police and for fire, you get a little over $27 million compared to over $200 million for the pension plan. So this is a much smaller plan and a much smaller liability. Uh, here we're showing the funded status. Uh, again, this is just for the explicit subsidy. The blue bars are the members in pay status. Uh, the reds are actives and the gold are the people who no longer work for the city but are entitled to a future benefit, uh, which is a much smaller group for uh, the OPEB benefits. Uh, the police plan, is funded at about 32% as of 2020. This does not include the, the investment returns uh, for 2021 and 28% for the fire. Um, again, though, the unfunded liability, even though it's a much smaller uh, funded ratio, the unfunded liability is also quite a bit smaller than the, the pension plan. Uh, here's the projections for police from the last valuation, just to get an idea of what we're looking at. There are a couple things to note here, uh, and the fire is, is very similar. We show it on the next slide. Uh, one is uh, the these gray bars are the liability. Uh, they're expected to grow for about uh, 10 to 15 years and then start to decline. And that's because of the closed nature of the full benefits. Eventually, uh, the liabilities here will be dropping. Uh, the assets we're projecting uh, to catch up uh, eventually, but we are starting at 32%. And so it is a, a long haul if all of our assumptions are met. On the contribution side, you can see the, the purple bars are the member contribution. As the rest of the tier one members retire, we're expecting those contributions to go uh, decline and go away. And the gold are the city's contributions. And so the city's contributions actually uh, are projected to increase a little more rapidly than just uh, uh, as a percent of pay because they're making up for the decline in the member contributions as well. This red line was the projection of the maximum uh, contribution that the city has the option of imposing. And so you can see we were uh, projected right above that line uh, for the duration here. And the fire uh, 
the numbers are slightly smaller than on police, um, but it's very similar patterns were projected. Now, uh, on the OPEB, it's not just the assets that are volatile, it's also the liabilities. And the key thing that drives the volatility and the liabilities is healthcare costs. And in particular, what is that maximum annual explicit subsidy that's driven by the lowest cost health plan? And, and so you can see uh, here, we've shown a history back to 2016 of what those numbers are. And, and you can see that the change from one year to the next bounces around a fair amount. Now, the good news is for the plan is this year, it dropped 0.8% for single, uh, for member only coverage, and about 0.5% uh, for all the other coverages. Uh, and that's because that maximum explicit subsidy, uh, it changed for the single members from the Kaiser 3000 deductible plan to the Anthem. $1,500 deductible plan, but it's still the Kaiser plan for the other coverages. Everyone uh, prior to six, age 65 uh, is receiving the maximum explicit subsidy, regardless of what plan they select, because they're all uh, more costly than, than the subsidy but all the Medicare eligible plans are below the maximum subsidy. So we're paying the full premiums for those Medicare eligible plans. And uh, those plans, the premiums decreased from 0.5% to 3.1%. So we'll also get some uh, additional gains uh, this year from the Medicare eligible plans costs. Any questions on that before I get into the assumptions? Okay. Uh, this is just a quick summary of our recommendations. I'm gonna take you through the discount rate and Mike's gonna take you through the rest of it. Uh, there's not a lot of changes in particular, not significant changes that we're recommending. Probably the most significant is a consideration of reducing the, the discount rate. The other things are um, pretty minor uh, adjustments to what we've been assuming. Our experience has been pretty close on, on these assumptions. Mm -hmm. So on the, the discount rate, um, the 115 trust has a different asset allocation than the pension trust. And so it also has a different expected return. Uh, and we compared, like we did for the pension, we compared Makita's expectations over 10 years and 20 years to um, the average assumption in the horizon survey of investment consultants over 10 and 20 years. And so you can see the median returns are, um, except for the, the horizon 20 year return are all lower than the current discount rate of six and a quarter. Here we're showing the history of uh, the range in Makita's assumptions, the bottom of the bar represents Makita's 10-year assumption, and the top of the bar represents their 20-year assumption. We generally have wanted to set the discount rate uh, in between the 10 and 20-year assumption. We note that um, about 40% of the value of benefits is paid out over the next 10 years, and 70% over 20 years. And so somewhere in that 10 to 20 year range is where we'd like to be. We also note that these capital market assumptions do move around based on a, a lot of different factors, but the, the two largest factors uh, seem to be interest rates and then the current market valuations. Um, that are driving these changes. 
So um, in 2021, the six and a quarter that we have, uh, it's still within this range, but it's right at the top uh, at the 20 year range. And, and so um, we're suggesting that you may want to consider taking a step uh, to be closer to the middle of that range down to six. You could consider something further, but we also know that you're revisiting the asset allocation uh, it, uh, in the next couple months. So that's that will be the, the big decision. Before we uh, get to a discussion to that, though, I'm going to turn it to Mike to run through the others. Okay, and then the other big thing that drives the liability is the future healthcare trend rates. And what we use is a, a medical trend model that was developed by the Society of Actuaries called the Getson model. And what it does is you really develop short-term estimates of what you think the trends are going to be over the next five years. And then it grades down over time to kind of a long-term assumption that healthcare costs can't increase more than GDP does because if it continues to outstrip GDP, at some point you reach the conclusion that all GDP is healthcare related, which is not reasonable. And so we're keeping the short-term assumptions pretty consistent with where they've been. It's been a kind of an interesting time because costs have been a little bit lower the last couple of years, more the costs of COVID have not outstripped the savings due to people uh, delaying care because they can't get in to see the doctor because things were closed down. And we're starting to see kind of some build back, not only of people finally being able to go to see care, but also some alarming signs that we're seeing increases in particularly cancer rates because people weren't going in to get their screenings. So keeping kind of things pretty much where they were uh, last year, starting at 7.66% for the non-Medicare and 4% for the Medicare eligibles. And then they adjust down to 4.93% by 2030, which is really the nominal GDP growth plus an excess medical cost because the medical cost continues to grow more than GDP because of all of the changes in medical technology. But then it grades down to our long-term projection of GDP growth at 3.78% by 2075. And we keep dental the same at 3.5%, kind of just a general right around that GDP growth. And the next slide actually shows this graphically. You can really see the longer-term assumptions are completely unchanged between the two. And so we've got a slightly increased set of assumptions for the non-Medicare eligible to reflect that kind of historical, we think there's going to be some slightly increased costs over the short term to reflect that bounce back in healthcare. But the Medicare actually runs the other way. Medicare experience has been kind of interesting that it's been a little bit better than expected. So it's, the line is a little bit lower for the next four or five years before it kicks back through. But in general, we're not going to see too much change in the liabilities really due to healthcare trends are pretty consistent with what our expectations were. And the next slide are plan elections. So we have to make some guesses as to where active employees will enroll once they retire. And what this chart shows by the pre-Medicare and the Medicare plans, the first column shows what we assumed in the 2020 valuation. And then the second shows how they actually enrolled in 2021. And you can see that pretty much we're spot on. There's some minor variations, but in general, people are enrolling where we expect. So the only change that we're recommending is for the Anthem plans is the city actually introduced a new Anthem plan called the Anthem Traditional. So it's an, an HMO plan that has a broader provider network than the current select plan is. So we're making an assumption that some people will elect to pay the extra premium to join that plan. Again, this at the end of the day will have a slight impact on the implicit subsidy because that's a more expensive plan, but it's gonna have no impact on the explicit subsidy because again, both of those plans cost more than the current explicit subsidy anyways. The next slide goes into the in lieu. So Measure F has this option that a retiree can actually elect to waive coverage in retirement 
and receive a credit equal to 25% of what that explicit subsidy is. And then when they come back to the plan, they can actually use that to help pay down their premium. So they can choose one of these more expensive plans and help pay for it by having this in lieu coverage. It's only been in place since measure F has been added. So last year we set it based on three years of experience. Now we've got four years of experience. And so we've been continually reassessing of what happens based on what we're really seeing happen going on over time. And so if we go to the next slide, we can see we're recommending some slight changes in the assumed tier coverage. And we can see at the bottom for the pre-Medicare, we're actually pretty close to what we assumed so that we assumed 25% would be retiree only, 20% would cover themselves and a spouse and 55% of family. The actual enrollment is 21, 23, and 56. So it's again, with limited number of people, that's fairly close. So we're recommending that one remain unchanged. We actually, our initial assumptions would be 50-50 for the Medicare eligibles. We're really showing that that's coming out very different. And so for last year, it was 32% were single, and now it's 68% uh, covered their spouse. So we're recommending we take a step downwards and change it to 40-60. The other assumption we have with the ELU, which we have almost no experience yet, is how long are they going to actually stay in, in loose status before they come back to the plan. And our current assumption is five years. We recommend we continue it at five years and see how it develops over time because very few people come back in. So it's really an assumption that's going to be interesting to monitor as time goes on. Uh, the next slide is the administrative expense. And if we kept with our historic methodology, we would be using $42.23 because we basically just increase it each year with the wage inflation. And so what this chart does is we took the historic experience from 2013 to, through uh, 2021, increased, basically increased it with the wage inflation, which is 3% for every year except for 2020, which is up to 3.25% to get it all on a equivalent basis divided by the number of members. And you can see the average actually has come down to 38.50. And you can see that's because for the last three years, so 19, 20, and 21, the expenses have come down based compared to what they were historically. And so we're recommending that we actually, instead of using the 42, bring it down to 41 to really partially start to reflect those lower administrative costs over the last three years. So those are all the assumptions with changes. There are a couple uh, other slides in the appendix uh, showing like dependent coverage elections where we were just right on um, and some additional in lieu elections where uh, the current assumptions seem right on. So um, we'd ask the board to make a decision on the, the discount rate and adopt the uh, recommended assumptions for the other health um, assumption, the trend rates and so forth through the administrative expenses. So before I open the floor, Bill, um, if I, I hear what um, you guys, uh, you and Michael are saying, everything below the discount rate is pretty straightforward. Is there anything we should be debating beyond the discount rate? I don't think so. Everything else is, um, you know, either our assumptions were right on or we're just making a minor tweak uh, that will not have um, will not have a material impact on it explicit subsidy in particular. Um, so there, we're not seeing any significant changes, really. Right, then, then let, me, let me break um, the board dialogue up into two pieces, board. Let me open the floor first, not on the discount rate, but on healthcare trend rates through admin expenses. Does anybody want to um, discuss any of those? Yeah, true. I have a couple of questions. Uh, I'll jump in. Not not discount rate, but everything else. Yes, so yes, ahead. yeah, yeah. So the first is a general question uh, to understand how this works. Um, so if when a retiree uh, becomes Medicare eligible, um, 
do they switch to a Medicare eligible plan and and, and are those much, uh, you know, cost as much less because I guess the federal government is paying uh, most of it. Is that, is that a fair assumption or? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Um, and the second on page seven, um, just, uh, you know, that how the liability kind of decreases, right? Yes. Um, over time, is that because you're seeing a transition from tier one to tier two and tier two costs less? So what is driving that decrease? Uh, well, there is no tier two. Okay, they don't, we don't pay. Okay. So the, it is just a closed group that's a subset of tier one. And so it's their uh, benefits getting paid out. I see, okay. Okay. It, it, it's part and parcel of the fact that they switched to Medicare at 65 so that all the actors end up retiring and then the agent is being mm -hmm. over 65, which is significantly less expensive than it is for the pre-65. I see. Got it. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you very much. I got a, I got a quick question, Drew. Andrew. Um, can you go to slide 17? Uh, it's in regards to health and lieu. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, the chart, the chart um, prior, you guys were talking to just about health and loo, and, you know, this will be our fourth year of, you know, trying to you know, create historical data. Um, but looking at the chart at the bottom corner on pre-Medicare, uh, Medicare, so if I add these up, you know, the pre-Medicare between retiree, retiree spouse, and retiree family, you know, we're close to 98, 99%. Is the other one to 2% basically the people that are participating in health and loo? No, these are of the health in lieu uh, people. Assume. Okay, sorry, I missed that. It says assumed health in lieu. Okay. Yeah, so these two add up to 44% and then 56. Uh, if we're off it, it's probably just a rounding issue. Do we have, do we have an idea of how many people are actually participating in health in lieu versus uh, taking benefits? If you don't do know, you have, yeah. Do you, do you have that data, um, Bill? Uh, I, I I believe um, I just asked staff, uh, Drew, and I'm told for police and fire, it just seemed low. It says about five point seven percent. Okay. Does that make sense? But does that make sense, Bill? I I think so. I'm trying to remember here. I mean, that's okay. I mean, if you don't have the numbers, I- I don't have the numbers in front of my me. My gut reaction was that I would expect it to be higher, but that's the number. I, I'll confirm it later, Andrew, but just, I know you had that question and I just wanted to make sure that you you heard that from me. Uh, yeah, I, are, I'll confirm it. We are seeing, I guess I'd echo that, Roberto, is I think the, the numbers we're seeing are probably higher. It depends on uh, this 30% is um, new active members retiring have the option to elect in lieu. Uh, so maybe 5% is when you're looking at the whole population. Yeah, the, the 5% is in the whole retiree police and fire population. I mean, close to 6%. Um, maybe, yeah. So I, I'll confirm that number later. And if you find something different, Bill, let us know. But that's, that's what I hear from staff. Yeah, and that's just mere, um, just out of curiosity to see how, you know, Health and Lou is impacting, you know, um, the health fund. And, and from my understanding is, you know, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, there is a savings to the plan as more people opt into Health and Lou. Um, it's a little... Ostensibly, yes, it's a little bit tricky because the question is, um, did they elect in lieu as opposed to just waiving coverage? Or did the in lieu encourage them to get their coverage elsewhere and elect in lieu? Okay. And if yeah, it's the so latter, we definitely save money if it's the former. Andrew, for the, for the most part, what people were doing, and this is why we negotiated this, they would take the lowest cost plan for free. Yep. What the city does in the in lieu 
is they're giving you like I want to say thirty or forty percent of what it would cost them for the medical in the in loop bank. I think it's twenty five. So, twenty five percent. Yeah, yeah whatever it is. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a substantial savings because before it was a opt in when you retire and if you didn't you didn't get it you had no other opt in choices so now they actually don't make it an irrevocable election. Yep. Okay. Thank you. You're on mute, Drew. Um. Thanks, Andrew. Anything other than discount rate floor still open? All right, hey, Bill, go to slide 11, will you? Let's go ahead and open up the um, uh, discussion on the discount rate. So, Bill, you're, you're clearly, I think, recommending we lower it. Uh, Bill, are you guys, I mean, I know you guys don't really like to recommend, but are you guys thinking six or are you thinking lower than six or are you sort of indifferent? Um, I guess if I'm making a recommendation, it's probably just to go to six because uh, we need to see what happens with capital market assumptions and what changes you make in the asset allocation before oh. making a more significant move. Yeah, Bill, go, go to slide be, 11. Go back one more slide because you're talking about that is the capital market assumption stuff. There you go. Keep going, Bill. Yeah. Um, so generally, we don't like making a significant move all at once unless uh, you know it's really warranted. And so, you know, I, I guess I'd say if the capital market assumptions stay where they are, we would probably ask you to consider further reductions in the future. But we know those move. So, um, you know, a quarter point is a reasonable uh, change at this point. All right, great. Yeah, floors open for um, any input um, on taking the discount rate to six or below six or leaving it where it is. Yeah, make I mean, a motion to lower it to six. Yeah, I think that's great. And and would you make the motion um, to accept all the other recommendations as well? Yes, absolutely. There's a motion uh, by Trustee uh, Vado um, to go to 6% and keep all the other um, recommendations. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, who was that? Uh, uh, <laughs> Minimal second. Two of, two of us. <laughs> Minimal second. Well, let's go around the room. Um, Andrew? Aye. Sunita? Aye. Howard? Yes. Ashvar. Aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. Dave. Aye. And I'm Chair Lanza. I vote aye. That's um, unanimous. Um, so thanks for reminding me. I, I, I don't know how I managed to skip that. Uh, we're all done with that then. We can move on to nominate um, elections, right, Roberto? That is correct, uh, Mr. Chair. Great. Okay, so we slightly changed the way we do it this year. Um, we, we used to stagger the chair and vice chair, but we've changed that. And so last month, um, Andrew was nominated uh, for vice chair. I was nominated for chair the previous month. We are the only ones uh, that have been nominated for those two slots. So we just, I think, just need to go, go around. Now, let's start first with um, vice chair Andrew. I'm just going to go around and, and call for the, the vote. We need to get six affirmatives um, in order to pass muster. Andrew? Aye. Sunita? Aye. Howard? Yes. Far? Aye. Dick? Yes. Franco? Aye. And Dave? Aye. And I'm trying to vote aye. So that's um, eight votes unanimous for um, Andrew. Congratulations, Andrew. Uh, I'm next. Um, as, oh, hang up. Uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Prefer. That means a lot to me. <laughs> or to Andrew, anyway. Hey, so for me now, uh, for the role of chair, um, Andrew? Aye. Anita? Aye. Howard? Yes. Bar. Aye. Dick? Yes. Franco? Aye. Dave? Aye. 
I vote for myself too. So that's also unanimous. Uh, so I, I can, I think Mayor Andrews is an honor to be nominated and reelected. And we're looking forward to having a fun year next year. Great. Okay. Now uh, it says here, now I've got a little script. So we're going to follow the script for item 4F. It says, Maytac, you got any comments you want to make first on item 4F, uh, the factual findings for AB 361? Over to you, Maytac. Hi, everyone. It's everyone's favorite subject of the, of the each meeting we have here. Um, a few comments. So as you guys know in the news, the uh, Omicron variant is alive and well in the United States, and the first case has been found in San Francisco in the Bay Area um, as of this week. Um, the proclaimed state of emergency is ongoing as um, the governor's uh, proclaimed state of de declaration of the proclaimed state continues to be in effect for COVID-19. And as of November um, 16th, the San Jose City Council has renewed its resolution to continue social distancing um, in city facilities. Now, there is one wrinkle that I do want to raise to the board, which is a matter of timing. The AB 361 law is relatively inflexible, and it requires by law um, that the board every 30 days make these factual findings to provide continuity for you guys to meet virtually. Now, the wrinkle here is that we're voting on December 2nd, uh, and 30 days from December 2nd would generally be January 1st. And um, the next meeting that you guys have regularly scheduled is for January 6, 2022. So that means between now and the end of the year, if the board so chooses to want to continue to meet virtually in January, um, that the board, uh, it would be our recommendation that the board um, schedule a special meeting to make those factual findings under the law. So with that, as of now, for the next 30 days, there are grounds for you guys to meet virtually based on A, the state of the, the declaration of the proclaimed state of emergency and to the city council's recent resolution for social distancing. Um, so I turn it back to you guys and open the floor for questions. Hey, Maytag, real quick. So there is no mechanism, I've, regular boards, we could do this through um, email through written unanimous consent. I assume we don't have that mechanism. No, so technically under the law, it requires a majority vote for every renewal. And, and we to, I guess what I'm saying is we have to meet in person over Zoom, or can that be done um, remotely via email? Well, I think it would have to be in a, in a live meeting for a majority vote to be recorded. I mean, so are we going to jump in, Roberto? No, we're just going to ask. So you suggesting we'll have a special remote meeting? Is that possible? Yes. Yes. Okay. And and I I I was trying to follow your statements, but I kind of got lost. What's the timing of it? When is when is it that this needs to happen so that we can start thinking about scheduling that special meeting? It has to happen before January first because thirty days from today is January first. Okay. So we do have our federated meeting on the sixteenth. So it could be any time between next week. Oh, it will have to be in the next two weeks. Or oh, I guess I suppose we could do it uh, uh, the week of December 20th, but that's close to Christmas. That makes it harder to get um, Roberto. everyone available. Yes. I got, I got a, a suggestion. Um, we do have an IC meeting coming up. There's four of us already there. And we can schedule it the same day, either right before the meeting or right after the meeting. Probably preferred to do it right before the meeting. Yes. And, and if we could get basically at least one more person to show up, we'll have quorum. Yes, I forgot about that. That will be December. Uh, the yeah, it's Friday the 17th, we're yeah, yes, 1038. It's a Friday. Just, okay. Uh, that might be a good option. No, I think you're right. I think that may, that may work. So um, I'll work with Linda and I'll make sure, I mean, unless there's an objection from the book, from the, uh, anyone at the board, we'll try to schedule a special meeting We'll work with Maytag um, um, of the board before your IC meeting, which I think is scheduled to start at 11 o'clock? No, it's, uh, it's at 10.30. Um, 10.30, okay. But, but I, the, yeah, we can talk about that, Roberto. I mean, it's there's a federated meeting prior to that, and it follows the federated meeting. So we may want to do it right after the end of the IC meeting, but we can talk about it. Okay, okay, we can talk about that. Very well. 
we'll stay in touch. We'll, we'll reach out to all of you. Thank you. Thank so you, I, Andrew. I can't resist asking Maytag. I know our betters in Sacramento are our betters, and they're infinitely wise. So most meetings happen monthly. So why not pick 32 days, 35 days? Is there a reason legal for 30 days? No, I honestly don't think the legislature really thought this through. I think when they were drafting this, they were kind of on the cusp of, you know, um, the governor recall re-election and the, the um, executive order is expiring. Um, they just kind of threw it together as an urgency bill. Now, I, I may have raised this before when I previously spoke about this bill. Um, my understanding from talking to people more closely affiliated with this in Sacramento is that there's no intent to modify this bill in any way. So until then, we were stuck with the 30 days. It's very inflexible, I know. It's, it's a kind of cumbersome, but um, they're making it cumbersome on purpose so that, you know, the boards have to justify their continued virtual meeting instead of... Uh, yeah, well, I went to college with these people and they weren't real bright when they were 20. And it's good to see that they have... <laughs> I'm sorry, I should not make political comments, but it's just not <laughs> stupid. I mean, there are, in fact, 31 days in a fair number of months. And anyway, so, all right. So, so the I, first I, open, I, any other comments? You want to jump in and make some snide remarks right behind my snide remarks, Roberto? No, I just wanted to say that uh, um, I'll, I'll work with, uh, with uh, Prabhu, obviously, and his staff as well. But um, the, the same thing is going to happen with the federal board meeting, May Tech. So, Prabhu, all I was going to say is when I reach out to you, we may want to call a special meetings for both boards that day so that we don't have to do two separate special meetings. So, anyway. I mean, but the Fed meets on, but there is a Fed meeting, right? And oh, again, for the 30 day room. Yeah, got it. Yeah, that's right, for the 30 day because they have a board meeting on the 16th, but they're going to have to have a schedule, a, a special meeting. We might as well use that same investment committee meeting. I mean, we'll talk to them, but. We might as well just use that same day so we can yeah. do yeah. We'll just all of it at the same time. We'll just need one Fed trustee in addition. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay. Hey, the floor Thank is you. open. Any other questions for Maytac? All right. I have a script. Here we go. Based on the information presented by Council. Thank you, Maytac. And provided with our uh, board backup materials, it appears that the following factual findings justify the continuation of virtual meetings under AB 361. Number one, the governor's proclamation of state of emergency continues due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And number two, San Jose City Council's recent resolution continues to impose or recommend measures to promote social distancing in city facilities. So can I call for a motion to adopt these two factual findings for the election to use the AB 361's abbreviated teleconferencing procedure for the next 30 days for this board? So move, Santos. I have, second by Santos. I have a second by Votto. Um, is there any discussion from the public or from the trustees? If not, we'll have a roll call vote. Andrew. Aye. Anita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Shvar. Aye. Nick. Yes. Franco. Aye. Dave, uh, Dave, how do you vote? Aye. And this is Chair Lanza, I vote aye as well. All right. Now comes. Um, oh, I just want to make one comment. I want to thank. Go ahead, Trustee Maycheck, jump in. I just yeah. wanted to thank uh, Trustee Gardner for flagging the November, um, I'm sorry, no, the, not November, December 17th IC meeting as a potential vehicle because I was not aware of that and it makes my job a little easier. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and that's, is that just PNF IC or is that joint IC? Joint too. Joint, yes. so you're going to get both boards at, the, at that meeting. If you just add one for two minutes, we can do, wrap the whole thing up. Okay. Um, so December, for those of you that have been here for a while, is a very busy month uh, for retirements. And we've got about, I think there's 20 of them here. So I'm going to go through this. All right. We are we are announcing the retirements and we'll have a vote to approve of Adolfo S. Acosta, police officer, police department effective December 25th, 2021. Merry Christmas with 27.34 years of service. David R. Burnett. Battalion Chief, Fire Department, effective December 9th, 2021, 25.41 years of service. John Boren, Police Sergeant, Police Department, effective December 11th, 2021, 
0.65 years of service. You almost made the big 3-0, John. Um, Richard Bravo, Police Sergeant, Police Department, effective also Christmas Day, 2021, with 25.3 years of service. Soren M. Coates, Fire Captain, Fire Department, effective December 11th, 2021, with 25.39 years of service. Scott Deal, Fire Captain, Fire Department, effective Christmas Day, 2021, 25.42 years of service. Hang Doan, I apologize if I didn't pronounce that right. Fire Engineer, Fire Department, effective November 13, 2021, with 27.18 years of service. Sergio El Farias, police officer, police department, effective January 8th, 2022, 26.26 years of service. Jason P. Herr, police lieutenant, police department, effective January 8th, 2022, 27.03 years of service. Kenneth B. Hoggard, police officer, police department, effective January 8th, 2022, with 25.8 years of service. Paul Kelly, the name rings a bell. Police sergeant, police department, effective December 11th, 2021. 27.4 years of service. Christina Little Cap, Police Lieutenant, Police Department, effective December 24th, 2021, 29.03 years of service. Another almost 3 0. Jerry B. Laird, Battalion Chief, Fire Department, effective Christmas Day, 2021, 25.89 years of service. Uh, Lee G. Lawrence, Police Officer, Police Department, effective Christmas Day, 2021. Ah, the big 3 0, 30.73 years of service. Good job, Lee with reciprocity. Todd M. Lonick, Police Lieutenant, Police Department, effective Christmas Day 2021, 30.23 years of service. We got a trifecta going here. David Melandrino, Firefighter, Fire Department, effective January 8th, 2022, 25.46 years of service. Robert Ragsack, Jr., Firefighter, Fire Department, effective January 8th, 2022, 29.53 years of service. Got three of them almost made, so 30 and two of them did. Mark Taylor, police officer, police department, effective Christmas Day 2021, 27.3 years service. Jim M. Bela, police officer, police department, effective Jan 8, 2022, 25.34 years service. Michael Wera, police officer, police department, Jan 8, 2022, 25.2 years service with reciprocity. And Keith Westy, fire department, fire department, fire captain, fire department, effective January 2022. 23.65 years of service. Whew, that's a long list. Do I have a motion to approve the service retirement? So move, Santos. I have a second. Second, second I have a, a motion by Santos and a second by Gardner. Let's go around the table. Andrew. Aye. Anita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Bar. Aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. Dave. Aye. I vote aye as well. Gentlemen, you want to say anything about these folks? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I just want to say, uh, you know, congratulations and appreciate everybody on this list that's retiring. Uh, thank you for, you know, for your service. Um, you know, next month, the list will probably be just as long. Um, but thank you. Enjoy your retirement. Stay healthy. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, Dick, yeah, Dick yeah, Santos. Just, just Dick Santos to all of them. The best. Thank you for the service. A lot of experience leaving, but we're very proud and uh, thank you for your job. Go ahead, jump in, Dave. Yeah, just like to echo uh, Andrew's words. There's a lot of uh, expertise leaving the uh, police department with this list. I've worked with every single one of them, and uh, they provided a lot of leadership and dedication to the uh, department and a lot of service to the citizens of uh, San Jose. So uh, enjoy your retirement, guys. Great stuff. Um, now on to deferred vested. Um, Kelly Knight Jonda, police officer, police department, effective December 31st, 2021, 22.64 years service with reciprocity. I, I forget, Robert, do, do we need to vote on these? Yes. Okay, do I have a motion to approve? So uh, move, Santos. Uh, a motion by Santos. Do I have a second? Second, Votto. Second, a motion by Santos. Second by Votto. Andrew. Aye. Anita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Eshvar. Aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. Dave. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Um, Fortunately, this this year, thank God, we've only got a sort of normal size 
uh, a death and survivorship list, but I'll read these off and then we'll have a moment of silence. A notification of the death of Richard Bibby, firefighter, retired December 1st, 1971. Good for you, Richard. Died October 4th, 2021. No survivorship benefits. Notification of the death of Bobby Burdine, fire captain, retired October 3rd, 1996. Died October 20th, 2021. Also no survivorship benefits. Notification of the death of Robert W. Carabal, firefighter, retired July 30th, 2005, died September 29th, 2021, survivorship benefits to Margot, Mar I'm sorry, Margot Carabal, spouse. Notification of death of Charles Farrow, firefighter, retired February 28th, 1998, died March 16th, 2021, no survivorship benefits. Notification of death of Glenn Terry, police sergeant, retired January 4th, 1983, Died August 8, 2021, no survivorship benefits. A notification of death of Lawrence Weir, police sergeant, retired September 15, 2001, died September 20th, 2021, survivorship benefits of Dorothy Weir, spouse. We'll have a moment of silence. Uh, thank you all. We had, we had, we had somebody there, gosh, he, Good for him. He made it 50 years in retirement. That must have been fun. Uh, anybody want to make any comments about these uh, good yes. folks? Yes, Mr. Chair Dick Santos. Uh, it's always sad, and I work with all of them here with Gordon the Fire. And uh, it's very sad because uh, Bob Carroll and I grew up together in Alviso as young kids, and it, it was very sad. But uh, their families, the best, and thank you for all the service. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, um, we're going to move on to committee reports. This is going to be fast. I don't think we had any committee meets, any committees meet in the interim. Um, Eshwar, any comments on the investment committee? Yeah, no, no meetings. Uh, we just have a special meeting to kind of waive the one month rule. Uh, and we need to, I guess, receive and file uh, the minutes of the last such meeting. So nothing, nothing substantive. Thanks, great. I will note that item um, 7.1b, we do receive and file the minutes. Um, on to um, the Audit Risk Committee, committee Sunita, any comments? Uh, no, same. I think the only agenda item was the uh, approval to continue online meetings. So nothing to report. That's great. That's great. 7.2b, we receive and file um, the minutes of that special meeting. Uh, governance, uh, over to you, Franco. Any Anything to report? Yeah, I don't think we have anything to report. That's great. So 7.3B, we again received and filed the minutes from the special meeting to continue uh, the angry resolution. Uh, disability committee, we didn't meet, Dick. Any comments? No, we'll be meeting here right after this. And then, of course, the other meeting on uh, December 6th. That, that, that is great. Thanks, Dick. And note that we received and filed those minutes. And finally, um, the JPC, um, Andrew, any comments? Uh, no comments. We did um, get a meeting scheduled um, coming up. So that will be the first time in a few months that we've met. That is great. Uh, excuse me. Anybody have anything you want to put on the agenda for the January meeting? If not, uh, any, any members of the public have any comments or anything they'd like to see us put on the agenda for next month? There's a hand up from Jill Borders, uh, Chair Lanza. Oh, uh, go ahead, Jill, jump in. Oh, thank you, but I'm sorry. I was thought that might be public comment, but I think you might be just asking for a uh, comment. Oh, oh, Jill, Jill, go ahead, it's time for public comments. Jump oh, in, anything you wanna okay. say? Okay, yes, I do. Thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'm pretty emotional, so I'll try to be normal. <laughs> anyway, I'm under self-isolation due to COVID, and so I decided that I would um, be online and watching every city meeting that I could because I'm sitting here in my room and <laughs> need to learn a lot more about anything right now. And um, my heart is really full as I listen to all of you and hear all the names of those that are retired and also those that have passed away. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart because I've lived in San Jose for 54 years. Um, and we don't often get a chance to thank our firefighters and our police officers 
And so I just genuinely want to say thank you because I really don't think people quite understand um, how important you all are. And I just want to say thank you. Um, you've literally um, gotten in a position where you saved uh, my life. And I want to say thank you and just tell you how much you all mean to me. And I hope you spread that word because you are loved, even if you don't get that message all the time. So thank you so much. Well, that means a lot. I, I, I'll let the um, firefighters and police speak out. I can tell you, Jill, you've, you've interacted with them. They saved your life. I've gotten to know them by socially and having beers are a good group of folks too, as well. Um, anything from the police or fire to Jill? Jill, this is uh, Trustee Wilson from the police side. I, I appreciate your comments and on, on behalf of the police department, we are out there to uh, serve the citizens of San Jose and, and we do know that the majority of the citizens do appreciate our work, but it's always nice to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jill, this is uh, Trustee Gardner. Um, I'm on the fire side. I definitely appreciate your comments. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we're here to serve the community and, and you know, when we get feedback like that, it makes it, you know, it's why we do what we do. And so we definitely appreciate uh, your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Jill, Trustee Dick Santos, uh, thank you so much for caring. <clears throat> appreciate it very much. God bless you. Thank you. All right, Valerie, you got to jump in. You're the fourth. Yeah, I'm just to echo what Dave said on behalf of the police department. It's a, it's a tough job, and we always, you know, we're not always making people happy, but um, it's really good to hear that people appreciate what we do. Thank Thanks. you. Glad, <clears throat> glad to see they saved your life, so you can thank them. Jill, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, that's the end of our meeting. So over to you, Maytag. Mr. Chair, before we 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 adjourn the meeting. If you yeah. allow me a minute, I just wanted to, this is you, I mean, <laughs> as it turns out, thank Maytag, we need to have another special meetings of your board, right, to have to meet the 30 day requirement, but this being the last regular meeting of the year, I wanted to take a minute uh, to first thank uh, your board for your support uh, of the staff and for your hard work and dedication throughout the year for the members of the police and fire plan. And I also wanted to take this opportunity to thank uh, publicly, uh, publicly the staff of our Office of Retirement Services. As you know, we're still working remotely. And like anybody else at the city and the own other jobs around the country, it's been a, a challenging year. So um, I just wanted to take this time to thank them on behalf of the members and you board, uh, the staff of our office for the hard work and dedication on serving our members here. So, Thank you so very much. Uh, again, thank you to you board for your work and your support of the staff uh, throughout this uh, calendar year 2021 and for your dedication to the plan members. So, uh, again, it's been a wonderful year so far and I wish all of you a very happy holiday. So thank you very much. Well, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of the board and it's just been an absolute pleasure to work with you and your great staff. You guys have maintained your wonderful sense of humor and your esprit de corps and i look forward to um better times well we had good times in 2021 despite the virus i look forward to continuing that with you and your staff into 2022 okay we are adjourned maytag over to you well thank you guys um and thank you for bearing with me um so the first meeting that we have here to call to order would be the um investment committee so if the chair of the investment committee could please call the meeting to order.